Good afternoon. I call to order the meeting of the Hamilton County Board of Commissioners staff meeting of March the 23rd. Good afternoon, Madam Commissioners. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We're gonna move forward. We have uh, quite a few items on our agenda and I was just told that we do have uh, some public that would like to make some comments. Um, in general, um, I'm not sure, Bridget, if it's related to some of the items on here or just a general comment. Steve, um, Cinnamon Pelly is going to comment on um, the, uh, the bus conversation. So okay. um, if anybody has a general comment, if they could raise their hand right now and we'll allow you to speak. And it does not appear that we have general comment at this time. Okay, thank you so much. Um, before we get started, I'd like just to just say a couple words uh, of our prayers go out, and I'm sure my colleagues agree for uh, the 10 people that were killed senselessly uh, in Boulder, Colorado. And so our prayers go out to the families and friends of those people, once again, uh, senseless murders that took place. So we certainly want to give our, our thoughts to uh, Boulder, Colorado. And also I just wanted to mention, we mentioned last week about severe uh, weather awareness week and it actually started on Monday, the 22nd through the 26th. So uh, Nick Crosley leads that um, surge as, as far as being the EMA director. So we once again want to acknowledge that this is the week uh, that it actually takes place. So uh, thank you, uh, Madam Commissioners. We will move forward. Um, to our first agenda item, I see Professor Holly McGee is on here. Um, and she's gonna talk about her initiative that she is working on. So welcome. You're muted. Thank you so much, Madam President. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. I apologize for my, my tardiness between uh, the two different assistants. I wasn't quite sure which link I should be following, but we've got everything sorted. Um, if I may, um, I'd like to thank uh, both you and uh, Commissioner Driehaus for making time for me in the past few weeks to speak about the initiative and, and giving me the opportunity to speak in front of the full board. Um, and I'll thank you in advance for your patience as I make the same presentation to the two of you uh, that, I, that I'll be making uh, to the rest of the board in just the, these next few moments. If I could possibly share my screen, may I share my screen with everyone? Sure. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I presume everyone can see this. Yes. Wonderful. Well, the reason I am uh, coming to you today, speaking with you all today, is because, um, and I know it's 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 very um, uh, strange, perhaps, to have a uh, professor from the history department to sit down and, and attempt to speak with you about something regarding uh, homeless uh, student housing. Uh, but the reason I come to you um, is because, as my work as a professor, uh, this is something that I'm encountering. You know, in the fall of 2018, I had a truly promising student who went from A's to F's in a matter of weeks. By the time she felt safe enough to confide in me that she didn't have financial support from her family back in Dayton, had been living on couches, but was recently kicked out after a minor dispute with her friend and was now living out of her car in the middle of November, it was already too late. I did what I could to help her locate 24 hour emergency housing on one of the coldest evenings of the year. But after a single night in the dorms, she was required to leave. Less than one week later, she dropped out of UC and returned to Dayton to live with an aunt who agreed to take her in. It was her junior year at the University of Cincinnati. The university did not need to lose that incredibly gifted student and Pathway to Success represents a unique refocusing of institutional vision that could ensure that we don't lose another to something so easily addressed as housing insecurity. You know, while the rising price of higher education and its implications for equity and accessibility have been extensively documented, the material conditions of students' lives are often overlooked. Doctor, doctor. 
Is Thank that you. your is that your dog in the background or is it I wonder it, is, not. it is my my neighbor's dog. Oh boy. Okay. It's, okay. <laughs> it's a very okay. big dog. Okay. He's he's working for you. Wow, okay. I apologize. No, it is not my dog. I do. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. That's why I got up and shut the door. He's a very big dog. Okay. I apologize since No, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> uh, so data from uh, more than 30,000 two and four year college students indicate at least one third of two year students, such as those at Cincinnati State, are housing insecure, including up to 14% who are outright homeless. Whereas between 11% and 19% of four year students, uh, such as those here at U University of Cincinnati where I work and across town at Xavier are housing insecure. These studies, however, do not address the unspoken personal costs often associated with student housing insecurity. Disproportionate exposure to arrest, incarceration, drug use, the development of mental health issues and sexual assault. No young lady who identifies as a bear cat, a musketeer, or a surge should ever again have to choose to sacrifice her virtue for a consistent place to sleep. You know, most of the students that I work with at the University of Cincinnati, they work and they receive financial aid to cover tuition, but only a fraction of them receive public or private assistance to help make the practical ends of housing and food insecurity meet. The city of Cincinnati is unique in the state of Ohio in that the Queen City is home to more than three, pardon me, is home to three colleges and universities that annually service more than 60,000 students. Pathway to Success would offer the University of Cincinnati, Xavier University, and Cincinnati State a unique collaborative opportunity to directly address the student homelessness crises on their respective campuses. It also represents an amazing opportunity for our institutions to work closely and without competition for this housing and security niche with both, the, with both the county and the state. Now, the goals are simple and there are only three. First, I want to encourage a reassessment of institutional priorities that recognize student homelessness as a critical issue. Caring for students is just as important as educating them. And the project provides measurable steps for materially supporting students struggling with housing and subsequent food insecurities. Second, I'd like to create an integrated educational and residential services program that directly improves the educational and psychological health and well-being of college and university students across Cincinnati. And finally, I'd like to build a stronger alumni base for all three institutions by removing the financial and emotional burdens associated with student housing and food insecurity, thereby increasing student retention and decreasing institutional dropout rates. At best, Residential insecurity forces students to prioritize meeting basic needs over educational engagement. At worst, college and university students are compelled to drop out, immeasurably and irreparably impacting their futures. So too are our individual campuses and the surrounding community of Cincinnati deprived of the special skills, talents, and potential contributions graduates of our institutions have proven they are capable of since 1819, 1831, and 1969. By creating a sustainable cross-institutional housing initiative aimed at significantly easing the financial burdens facing students struggling with housing insecurity, Pathway to Success has the potential to serve as a national model for institutions determined to address the housing insecurities of their most vulnerable, of their most vulnerable students. Innovative reordering of existing institutional infrastructures would ensure this project becomes a city-wide collaboration inclusive of the educational, corporate and community entities for which Cincinnati is known. Pathway to Success offers a sustainable, collaborative and affordable solution to student homelessness that has the potential to positively impact the lives of thousands of students for the foreseeable future. And I really look forward uh, to this conversation over these next few minutes to speak with uh, the entire board uh, to see how you all could lend your special skills, talents, thoughts and ideas to making Pathway to Success a reality for the city of Cincinnati. Thank you very much. Um, um, I, I was truly impressed with the conversation that, that we had uh, a couple of weeks ago. And um, I will open it up um, to our other, my other colleagues, uh, Vice President Alicia Reese, did you have any comments on the concept itself or uh, what you think we might be able to do as a board, uh, if anything? Um, Madam President, I just want to thank you for having this presentation today. This is my first time. Uh, Dr. McGee, thank you for your work. It's my first time um, seeing uh, this and um, digesting it. I just certainly want to thank you for your work and Madam President, look forward to 
hearing uh, in the future, there are some areas that we can work together. Uh, I don't know if this is going to go to the administration or however you want to do it, uh, mm -hmm. but I am interested in hearing more about that. I mean, having homeless students who are trying to better their education and trying to, uh, you know, make it out here. I mean, this is, you know, certainly something that we don't want to have. So I'm mm -hmm. interested and certainly will follow your lead on this. Mm -hmm. well, thank you so, so much. And uh, Vice President Reese, you bring up a good point because the viability of our uh, assistance will be dependent on an assessment uh, by our administrator if we choose to help with that uh, effort, but thank you so much. Um, Commissioner Driehaus. Yeah, thank you, Madam President. Thank mm -hmm. you, Dr. McGee. It's good to see you. Um, you. Yeah, we had a, a good conversation about the need, and we did a, just a little bit of brainstorming um, on the call uh, regarding what might be options uh, for the county. And so I, too, will look forward to the administration weighing in and making recommendations. Um, some of the things that we had talked about uh, yeah, we do sir, or, uh, have the strategies to end homelessness. They are recipients of levy dollars through the Indigo Care Levy. And so um, I'm wondering if there's a fit there. Um, also wondering if there's a fit through some of the American Rescue Plan dollars that we're due to receive. And maybe there's a nexus there. We've, we've done some work um, to make sure that people that are experiencing homelessness are housed through our previous round of dollars. So I'm wondering if that's not a good fit, maybe temporary, but uh, at least a start. And then um, I also had mentioned the, the idea that all three of us support um, an effort from the county to get more involved when it comes to affordable housing um, through a group that will be stood up uh, mid-year or so. Um, and from my vantage point, affordable housing does go all the way from affordable housing and, and different forms of that, but also all the way down to the homelessness situation in our county. And so um, I believe there's probably a nexus there and, and maybe we can incorporate some of this into um, that group's work uh, as we go. So those were just, that's just my first um, kind of off the cup thoughts, uh, but I'll look forward to um, getting a, you know, having the, the administration weigh in and then continuing to try to think through what we can do here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I believe that um, Jeff also spoke to uh, the professor. Am I correct? Well, I, I think we'd emailed each other a few times. We haven't okay. spoken uh, yet, okay. but uh, no, happy uh, and looking forward to uh, connecting uh, with, with Dr. McGee. And uh, as the board all mentioned, um, we have a couple of different efforts going on right now. The uh, our affordable housing or our housing plan, I should say, um, that we're in the process of, of uh, assessing on behalf of the board, which as Commissioner Driehaus indicated, um, you know, a, a housing plan looks at housing across the, uh, the gamut of housing options in the community from uh, you know, executive housing at the very top through market rate, um, workforce, affordable housing, but into the emergency shelter uh, realms as, as well. So I uh, look forward to wrapping that conversa uh, this conversation into that effort and also looking at other ways that we might do some of the uh, departmental efforts, either through JFS or community development, um, look at some um, more uh, timely ways that we might be able to tie in programmatically here as well. I know that the doctor has talked with uh, Joy Pearson, I believe, in community development, so we'll, we'll circle back with Joy um, and see if there's any uh, ideas uh, for how we might uh, tie into uh, Dr. McGee's efforts uh, as well through that. So I'll certainly report back to the board. Uh, once we have some more conversations on this and uh, connect more with Dr. McGee. Thank you. And, Madam uh, I, yes. Uh -huh. can, I, can I just uh, add something? I want to piggyback on Commissioner Driehaus. Uh, she brought up some very good points. Mm -hmm. We have a, a consultant, I think, is looking at our levy, different levies, and mm -hmm. certainly this should be on the table as they're looking at that. And then also um, she brought up the um, uh, affordable housing or housing as Jeff brought up. And I think it, uh, you know, we got a lot of people at the table. We should definitely have the universities possibly that deal mm -hmm. with housing to be at maybe a part of that. Um, mm -hmm. Cause you know, maybe Dr. McGee or someone else that deals with housing. Cause she's brought up a good point, you know with the university, that's a big recruitment of people wanting to mm -hmm. come here or people want to stay here and go to school here. Um, so maybe you want to add them possibly. So I thought that was a good point. Uh, Commissioner Driehaus brought up and mm -hmm. maybe um, add that to the, to the things that they're looking at. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. And that's uh, really important to improve and 
we improve our involvement by including more partners uh, that are part of the, the, and they can be part of the solution. And I know, I don't know about you guys, but when I think about homelessness, I really didn't think about the students. I have to be honest. Um, and so you think about trying to get your education to further your life and to, and to do better and you're in a car doing your homework. Um, so um, Jeff, as we look at these uh, possible solutions, if we can also consider the fact that some of the students are out of state, uh, out of Hamilton County and our ability to help the ones uh, that are here that are not necessarily uh, residents. That would be uh, interesting uh, to me also. Okay, and um, Dr. McGee, I'd also like to know as we look at how we can help, if you can uh, maybe be specific on where you would like our help. Um, we know of course right. housing is, is, is the main thing, but how, yeah. what uh, can we help? And maybe you don't know, but I'm sure Jeff will help you with what we can do and what right. we can't do. Okay. Well, I've been, thank you so much, Madam President. You know, I've been in a really good position these past few weeks uh, because of my work with the UC Venture Lab to be in the presence of and be um, speaking with and working with people who know what they're doing. So not only have I been able to speak with Joy uh, Pearson, I've been able to speak with property developers, uh, like people from the model group. I've been able to reach, uh, reach out to people with Lighthouse Youth Services um, and a number of other places that do very similar work. And so what I'm seeing, what I'm learning um, is that there needs to be a multi-layered, multi-level response for both mm -hmm. a short-term and a long-term response. You know, mm -hmm. a short-term response that is, you know, emergency housing, no questions asked, you know, three to four days, at least 72 hours someplace where students can be safe, be warm, um, and not have to be concerned about security knocking on the door at 7 a.m. saying you have to leave. So there needs to be a short-term solution for students and then a long-term solution that has options for students at different need levels. There are mm -hmm. students who want to and need to have that very structured dorm type of residential living type community. And then there are other students, grad students, who don't want or need that level of interaction. Mm -hmm. Need is breathing space. You know, I know I, I, I communicated this to both you, uh, Madam President DeMoss and Commissioner Driehaus that, uh, you know, students don't want a handout. You know, most of my students at UC, they have jobs, uh, you know, the 40% of them have two jobs, you know, mm -hmm. so they're accustomed to working, they want to work, they enjoy working, what they need is some breathing space, you know, mm -hmm. a, a, you know, a short and a long term solution that might provide some type of direct cash deposit uh, for students, you know, the, the idea that only $1,500 could avert student homelessness altogether, mm -hmm. my mind. You know, it's dollars they could take care of a deposit, first month's rent, put some utility you know, utilities, and put some groceries in your refrigerator. Students, mm -hmm. if they could make it, um, so there needs to be a short and a long term solution. And I'm hoping that the county will step in in such a way. Um, if I may, I have a. Um, um, I know that I shared a potential funding chart or uh, mm -hmm. support with you and Commissioner Driehaus. May I show that to the entire board? Is there time for that, or would you prefer to just send that? Well, are you going to go through the whole thing, possibly? Uh, I, I could, or I could just send the, 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 the sheet. Well, well, you know, uh, Dr. McGee, I see you coming back before us. I mean, if the okay. other would like for that to happen, fine. But I see, as you and Jeff speak, uh, that that chart that you have may even change. Um, okay, great. Uh, why don't we do that at, a, at another time? That sounds great to me. With you. That sounds great okay. to me. Is that okay? Was, uh, whatever the suggestions of the of the county board are at this point. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming and let letting us know about your initiative. And thank we're all excited about it. And we're we're not going to sit on it. I'm sure uh, as it relates to letting you know what we can provide as a system. So thank wonderful. you so much. Thank, thank you all so much. Have a wonderful day. Uh huh. You too. Okay, next on our agenda, we have Metro Operations presentation. Mr. Haley is here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Madam President, Commissioners, uh, I wanna thank you for allowing me a few minutes today to speak. Um, also wanna thank you for all the hard work you all are doing, um, as well as your support of transit um, and how important transit is you know, as we move our, our, um, our county forward. Um, I'll, I'll give you an update on where we are on reinventing Metro and some of the exciting things that are happening here at Metro and be happy to answer any questions. My next slide. Of course, reinventing Metro, these are the things that it will actually accomplish. It'll drive economic development. It'll improve mobility for all. It will attract new businesses and employers to our region. 
as well as access to not just more, but higher paying jobs. And of course, by having access to more higher paying jobs, it will have an impact on, um, it will have an impact on homelessness, as we talked about, as well as poverty. Um, also improvement to the local and the regional quality of life, and all of those things work to expand our regional connectivity. So for reinventing Metro, what it would actually do is it increases the frequency. So that's the wait time between the buses, shortable wait times, which helps you move much uh, faster through our region. Uh, better amenities, benches, shelters, transit centers, uh, safer, more comfortable places to wait. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, as well as the span of day. And that's how long the buses run each day. We'll talk about that a little bit in a minute as well. And all of those things working together decrease the travel time that people will spend on the bus in our region. So reinventing Metro, um, what it will give is 20,000 more jobs will be accessible by Metro. 740 more employers will be accessible. And uh, total wages, $850 million in total wages accessible by Metro. So uh, the, end of, um, the end of May, we will begin, um, we had, uh, told the community we were gonna start six routes with 24 hour service. Um, as we uh, attempt to exceed the expectations, we're actually gonna have seven routes with 24 hour service. Uh, there will be a crosstown route going through the middle of what you see on that map. And that will give access to more than 50% of the jobs in Hamilton County will have 24 hour access. Uh, more than 10,000 employers will have access uh, with more than 24 hour service, which means better connections to those second shift and those third shift jobs. So reinventing Metro in a nutshell is more frequency and span uh, for faster travel, more crosstown routes, so people don't have to come all the way into downtown to get to their destination, which will help them move much quicker through the community, more transit centers, much safer places for people to wait and transfer buses, uh, more new buses. Right now, about half of our fleet has free Wi-Fi. By the end of this year, 100% of our fleet will have free Wi-Fi. And again, for the last few years, all of our buses that we've bought have charging ports. So you can charge your phones and you can plug your computers in while you travel on the bus. Um, more suburban job connectivity. And that's where we're talking about some of those higher paying jobs, access to those. And then of course, a, a new option for uh, uh, Hamilton County, uh, bus rapid transit, uh, which helps the uh, system move much faster with limited stops and uh, bus only lanes and queue jumps and things like that. So at the end of May, we have service improvements, the Route 4, the 11, the 16, the 17, the 20, the 33, the 43, the 46, the 51, and the 78. Those routes will all have increased frequency. Um, there'll be a seven, uh, seven routes that will operate 24 hours a day. We have increased Saturday and Sunday service. One of the things about our, our service right now is our service drops way off on Saturday and is almost non-existent on Sunday. Uh, come the end of May, 1st of June, there'll be a lot more frequent service on Saturday and a ton more frequent uh, service on Sunday, which will really give access to people to move about our, um, our county, uh, as well as increased frequency for faster service through the county. So some of the things that we promised in, um, in the reinventing Metro plan was that we would reintroduce the Everybody Rides Metro uh, Foundation and we will fund it at a half a million dollars a year. I'm happy to say that as of January, we have uh, relaunched Everybody Rides Metro. We currently have about 12 agencies. We're working to get up to about 100. And the way that works, the 503C agencies um, in Hamilton County that provide rides to people, to jobs, job training, medical services, social services, they currently purchase those fares from us to help people get started. And what we're doing is we're reimbursing them 50% of the fares that they're paying, which will allow them to help many more people. That started in January, and we um, in January we had eight. We were up to 10 in February. I believe we're at about 15 um, agencies right now. We're working up to get up to about 100 agencies to really be a part of the community. Um, fare simplification is something else that um, reinventing Metro does. Um, one of the challenges uh, for our system today is we have five different zones. Uh, what reinventing Metro will do 
um, that fair simplification will do is it will change that from five zones to three. So all of the local uh, routes in Hamilton County will all be one fare. And then there'll be one single fare for the express routes and then another single fare for the outline county routes. Another part of this is all of the transfers will be free. So if you're using the app, the uh, transfers on the app are free. If you don't have the app, you can go to the sales office, buy five ride ticket, and then transfers on that five ride ticket are all free. So our day pass cost will go from 450 to four dollars. Um, and then of course access, uh, instead of having two fares for access, which is our paratransit division, uh, at 350 and 450, those are all four dollars. The other thing we're really excited about is all of the improvements that you'll see on the fixed route side, those same improvements will be for our paratransit service for access service as well. So again, as you know, 25% of the proceeds of the levy are going towards infrastructure projects in Hamilton County. Those projects include building or maintaining roads and bridges. Those roads and bridges must be within the service area where uh, Metro buses operate on. And I'm really happy to say that our board approved the process in um, March. So we're doing a request for uh, projects uh, the 1st of April. Those uh, proposals will be due by June 30th. Uh, they will be reviewed and scored between July and August. And by the end of this year, we will actually be funding some of those infrastructure projects. So we're really excited about that as well. I'll talk a little bit about some of our accomplishments. Um, of course, we'll start with in May of last year, we passed a countywide uh, transportation levy. It's the first levy that's been passed since the early 70s. We opened up a new uh, transit center in Northside. If any of you haven't been there to see it, it is an absolute beautiful facility. Um, we thought about the future. So we ran the conduit for uh, charging electric buses. So when our fleet begins to be electrified, this uh, transit center is ready to charge those electric vehicles. We, have also, we also have a park and ride at the Northside Transit Center. And we have a couple of spaces in that park and ride where you can charge your electric uh, vehicle. So you can park your electric vehicle there, charge it while you move throughout our community on the buses. We brought our um, paratransit service in-house. It was run by a third party. We brought it in-house in 2020 because we believe we can do a better job. Um, we had really begun to uh, really um, increase our ridership. Through the first quarter um, prior to COVID, we had actually experienced our first ridership increase in over a decade. But then of course, COVID changed things. Another accomplishment we made in 2020 was we, we moved into a new administrative offices, which are on um, Vine Street. We're at 525 Vine. And if any of you have time to come and get a, a tour of our new facilities, we'd love to have you. But being good stewards of the taxpayers' money, I'm also happy to say the new facilities are much nicer than our old facilities, but we pay less for the new facilities than we did for the old facilities. One of the challenges for transit across the country is hiring enough operators to operate the transit systems. Um, I'm happy to say that in 2020, for the first time in more than a decade, we became fully staffed with operators. Um, we also became uh, one of the first businesses in the city to recognize Juneteenth as a paid holiday. We installed 50 new benches last year, and we also secured a contract to install another 400 benches, as well as 205 new shelters at bus stops. One of the things we're extremely proud of about this is those benches and those shelters, they won't cost us anything to procure, nor will they cost us anything um, to actually put in place. So we signed a contract with a vendor who they will purchase the, um, the uh, benches and shelters, and they will install them. They will advertise on the benches and in the shelters, and the revenue that they will generate from advertising will pay for the benches and the installation, and it will even generate additional revenue for us to help operate the bus system. So we're really excited about that. We gave Government Square our biggest transit center a facelift. We're happy that we were awarded $3.4 million in competitive uh, ODOT grants, uh, State of Ohio grants last year. And um, at the beginning of COVID, one of the things we're really proud uh, that we did in order to keep our customers safe, as well as our drivers safe, we in-house, our maintenance team designed, fabricated, and installed barriers on 100% of our buses. And by doing that, what most transit systems did is they roped off half the bus 
to keep the social distance between the operator and the um, passengers. What we did by installing these um, barriers, we kept our, uh, our employees safe, but it allowed us to open up the entire bus so our passengers could social distance. We did that all in-house and we're really proud that 100% of our fleet, very quickly, we had um, those uh, barriers on the buses. We also reimagined our customer care center, which was open, excuse me, Monday through Friday. We are now open seven days a week. So customers can call and get information from us as well. We did that in 2020. We added 19 new buses in 2020 and another 10 more in February of this year. We completed what we call the fast stop program, which we looked at all of our bus stops, where they were, how they were spread out and re restructured how our bus stops are to make sure that they're in the right places and that our buses can move very quickly through the corridors. We renegotiated our Wi-Fi data contract. We actually saved $60 per month per bus. And again, by the end of this year, we'll have a free Wi-Fi on 100% of our fleet. We also launched a new Metro Veterans program. So veterans now only pay half fare to ride our buses. We received a couple of awards, the APTA Security uh, Excellence Gold Award, we received the APTA Ad Wheel for Best Print Media Award to increase ridership. Uh, four of our employees won APTA Excellence Awards. We had more than 100 employees receive Safety Mouth uh, Stone Awards, and I received a couple awards myself. The whole goal here is to exceed the expectations. We made promises to the community. We will live up to all of those promises, and it is our job here at Metro to work extremely hard to exceed, uh, exceed those promises. Um, those are just some of the um, exciting things going on here to uh, implement reinventing Metro. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. And again, thank you for all the hard work that you all do. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, I, I, I am worn out. <laughs> um, I just wanna thank you and your team uh, because oftentimes when we pass a levy, uh, our citizens are wondering, what do we do with the money? Um, and so, and how did that help me by, you know, by increasing my taxes? So um, I just have a couple other comments, but I'll open it up to our, my colleagues, uh, Vice uh, President Reese, uh, if you have anything you'd like to add. Uh, no, I actually got a chance to uh, see the presentation and mm -hmm. uh, ask questions. I just want to say, uh, it looks like we're, you know, moving in the right direction. And I uh, obviously want to put on the table one of the biggest themes uh, with that was advertised was the Western Hills Viaduct. And I think uh, uh, we talk about the city and the county working together. Uh, and I think we're together on that um, with the board and the city, uh, but also making sure that there are also other um, entities, villages and townships that are able to have uh, access to these grant dollars for their roads and bridges as well. So um, I think that, you know, our county, uh, our, our commission board has taken a leader, leadership role. And I just want to highlight that this is something else that the city and the county is working together on. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Driehaus. Yeah, thanks, Madam President. I just have a couple of things. Um, Daryl, when you talk about the expanded routes, especially the kind of the second shift later in the evening routes, and I, I look at the map, um, did you figure out those routes relative to some of the, um, I guess the business hubs, I think of um, the hospitals and in Clifton, uh, kind of a 24 seven operation. Um, I see the one cross town in, in black, um, can you help me just better understand the rationale behind some of the, it looks a lot like a hub and spoke. Um, and I know we're getting to a more regional cross, cross county um, structure here. Um, and so just, can you just talk me through this map a little bit? Sure, the, these are just the first year changes. Um, there are additional cross town routes in out years, which will connect even more and more of the, um, of the county. What, what this does, what we did is we looked at where the jobs hubs were and where the density was so that we could make sure we connected the most of the density to where the jobs were. So this is just phase one of reinventing Metro. There are several other, um, and I'd be happy to come back and give you a much bigger view of reinventing Metro year two, year three, but this is just the first phase of reinventing Metro where we really focused on the job hubs and the density um, to make sure we were connecting those people 
to the jobs that they needed to connect to. Okay. Yeah. You know what? Maybe we can do that offline. I can see some of the um, maps that are a few more years out so I can better understand this movement yes. to cross county routes, which was another thing that was promised um, by way of the levy. Um, secondly, the, you mentioned the fare change, and that's already gone into effect, is it not? It goes into effect April 4th. Okay. All right. I, yeah, I applaud that. I think it'll simplify things a bit um, and hopefully make it just more predictive, you know, for, for the folks that use the buses. Uh, and then my third item is the Western Hills Viaduct. Um, I too want to put that back on the table and um, just make sure that uh, we're on record as being in favor of it. We just put in for, um, put a letter of support together for the infra grant. We're constantly begging for money for the Western Hills Viaduct. Uh, and so SORTA's money is no exception. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I will echo what Commissioner Reese said and mm -hmm. make sure that's front and center. Well, there, there's a lot of um, commitment from the community. I thank you, uh, the commissioners, for your uh, commitment and support. We have an excellent uh, board of directors here at SORTA and the uh, leadership staff here at SORTA, we're all working together. Um, we are going to make this happen. Um, we are going to reinvent uh, transit in our region. I mean, I think we're gonna put, I'm positive, we're gonna put something out that we're all gonna be very proud of. Nice background, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. I was, I was getting ready to say the same thing. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of things. I know with the north side um, development, I was there for the groundbreaking. So I certainly will come and see uh, what ended up uh, being built. And then I just saw an advertisement yesterday that you were hiring a thousand operators. Um, uh, we're not hiring a thousand operators. Over the course of the next few years, we will be hiring about a hundred operators. We're trying mm -hmm. to get another, um, we're trying to get another 30 or 40 operators right now. So we are definitely hiring. As we put out additional service, we're gonna need additional operators. Um, so anyone that knows anyone that's looking for a job, operators, mechanics, um, all of the jobs are posted on our website. Uh, we could appreciate any help that anyone could give us. We are hiring right now. And these are good paying jobs. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good because as soon as I saw it, and I'm sure it said a thousand, you might want to check with the news uh, people because I immediately text, they hiring a thousand, are they getting rid of the other ones or what? You know, I was thinking, why would you need a thousand? So anyway, I'll just drop that in your ear and you can check and see how they, uh, the media dealt with it. But other than that, I don't have any, uh, anything else um, to add. And we just thank you so much for coming. I wanted to comment about what Commissioner Driehaus said about, you know, looking at the third, uh, second and third year offline, but we really, we want it online. Uh, we want you to come back and show us that so we can be as transparent as possible. And the fact that our board is a, a visionary board, that we need to see where you're going. So, uh, yeah, we'd appreciate you coming back. Uh, we'll let you know when. Okay. I'd love to. And yeah. uh, the other thing that we constantly do, we're constantly out in the public talking to the public about what changes. So also part of the um, adding of the seventh route, of uh, 24-hour route, was from the uh, feedback that we got from the communities asking, is there any way you can connect something else? So we'll continue to be in the communities, asking them questions, telling them what's next, getting their feedback, and then working their feedback into our plans for the future. Great. Madam okay. President, can I ask yes. one other question? It's sure. very off topic. Um, but there at one time was a bill running through the legislature that um, talked about added protections for transit workers, uh, bus drivers included. Um, I don't know, it didn't pass uh, when I was there, Alicia. I don't know if it passed when you were there, but I feel like it didn't pass. And so if ever, I, I just wanna offer that um, if that were to come forward again, I don't know if someone's carrying it, this General Assembly, but um, I, don't, I don't wanna speak for my colleagues, but please do check back because um, I wonder if we would be in a position to write a letter of support for that legislation mm -hmm. to protect our transit workers. Thank you very much for that offer. And uh, believe me, we'll take you up on that. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Okay. Thank you, sir. Good to see you. We'll be seeing you soon. All right. See you soon. Thank you. Uh -huh. All righty. Um, our next item on the agenda is um, we, are, we brought this back for today, a resolution authorizing the ward of a, an agreement. Um, so I'm going to open it up. And Jeff, you can take the lead on this. Uh, sure. Thank you, Madam President. So um, this item relates to um, probation's bid process for electronic monitoring services. 
um, and, and some questions that were raised uh, regarding that award and, and that process. So uh, just a little bit of background, as the board is aware, uh, electronic monitoring services are a critical element uh, that the county uses or a critical program that the county uses to prudently manage uh, its jail population and make sure that uh, scarce um, uh, jail county jail resources are used for uh, the most serious of, of offenders. Um, that's just a little bit of background so folks who may be watching understand um, what we're talking about. Uh, so as it relates to the questions that were raised at the, at the last meeting, uh, I did convene with uh, purchasing uh, and probation who walked me through uh, that process. I uh, had forwarded on a memo to, to the board on this. Uh, it does appear that the question uh, at hand here uh, relates to the degree of allowance uh, offered uh, by uh, an individual bidder who has raised some, some questions as well as some logistical questions about how equipment is, um, is, uh, is sent back or not. Uh, for repair services. So as opposed to me um, walking the board through that, I did think it was important uh, to reach out to probation. So we have uh, Phil Reed um, with uh, the probation department who is on. I don't think he has video, uh, but I do believe he has uh, um, uh, audio uh, capability to, to weigh in here. So uh, Phil, I'm gonna turn it over to you if you are able to, uh, uh, to uh, chime in on the, on the Zoom uh, to just walk the board through the, uh, the the salient issues as it relates to the allowances uh, and the um, logistics of equipment, um, battery changeouts, things of that nature. And Phil, you might be muted, so you might want to click on the, uh, the the mic there if you are able to. And uh, Bridget, I assume we have him on the uh, on the right side of the. You know, I actually do not see him on here unless he is telephone number 513-620-3900. That is I not his cell. Um, I can text him here. He sent me something just a, a little bit ago saying that he was on. I'm not getting it. Madam President, I was going to ask yes. if, if we're unable to get him on. I know there's several uh, folks on the call for the next item. And uh, if we can't get him on the call, I, I mm -hmm. would recommend if we could hold this. And yeah, you want to hold. If possible. I'm, I'm sorry, Commissioner. I, I would I would agree. I just got a text back from Phil saying the audio is not working where he okay. is. So we'll have to set him up through a phone to, to call in. Uh, okay. So, it, it, yeah, I would say if the board wants to move on, we'll correct the uh, the audio issue and you can circle back. Certainly. Okay. Um, our next item on the agenda is a resolution launching the Hamilton County COVID-19 one-stop resource mobile tech bus. And we're going to, uh, Vice President Reese will lead us in this discussion. Well, thank you, Madam President. Mm -hmm. um, and if we could uh, share the screen. Quentin's on now, he should be on. And we have several people that uh, have called in uh, that like to talk about this. But um, so uh, we heard a lot certainly about the issue of equity and getting um, vaccine to, uh, you know, to underserved communities, to African-Americans. Uh, we also have heard about economic resources, which all our board has voted on these things to get to um, to the community. And so today uh, I'm presenting a resolution uh, that would be a, a Hamilton County equity and resource mobile tech bus. It would deal with testing, vaccination, screening, economic resources, and more. It's not a one-time use. Next slide. And just some background. Uh, as we know, in the United States, uh, we continue to grapple with the current COVID-19 pandemic with almost uh, uh, 
uh, you know, so many people, over 500,000 deaths um, that we have from this COVID, uh, longstanding systemic health and social inequities that put racial and ethnic minorities uh, groups, as well as those from lower income families at risk of getting sick and dying from COVID because of these underlying health disparities. Uh, there's increased evidence that some uh, racial and ethnic uh, minority groups such as African Americans and Hispanic communities are being disproportionately affected by COVID-19, according to the CDC. Research also suggests that those with pre-existing health conditions have presented with higher rates of COVID-19 infections, according to the CDC. And I would like to add that all of us, uh, you know, unfortunately know someone has been affected, uh, but I uh, have one that's been in uh, the hospital for a year now because of these uh, um, underlying conditions. They've had two strokes, they have to get a trach, and this person is uh, only, I believe, 40 years of age. Uh, next slide, please. Um, at the board, um, the board had great leadership uh, and led on racism as a public health crisis. A uh, resolution was passed uh, that you all passed in July of last year. And in that resolution, it talks about a lot of the health disparities that exist in Hamilton County and why those uh, health disparities are critical that we begin to address them and um, uh, begin to address them so that we can lower that disparity. Uh, next. So just some background. Um, I had a virtual town hall um, and uh, about where are we? It was in February 12th. We had the governor on, uh, we had uh, Renee Mahaffey Harris of the Health Gap and Richard uh, Lofgren of UC Health and uh, uh, Joe Mallory of the NAACP Health Commissioner um, Kesterman and uh, certainly wanted to have my colleagues on, but then I was told uh, legally we can't be on all on the same thing. Um, and something like this, but we had a great conversation about the issue of, at that time, you remember getting the vaccine, we didn't have enough supply and then it wasn't getting to African-Americans. And so one of the things, there were two things uh, said and suggested in this was one, obviously getting it to African-American churches, not just as a site, but be able to have a partnership with the people who are members of the church can actually get the vaccine. The governor said at that time, we weren't in the churches, but said if you, uh, if we would give some churches to Hamilton County Commissioner Kesterman, he would make the supply available. As many who are watching, we can't control the supply. The supply comes from the federal government into the state, and then the governor decides who gets it, who's eligible for it, and how much do we get. Um, but he did make it available. Um, but the other thing that was brought up by President uh, Joe Mallory of the NAACP was that why can't we get a mobile bus and come out and just really get going? But we didn't have a model at that time that we could point to. Uh, but he did bring that up to uh, Dr. Uh, Lofgren as well as the governor. Next slide. Um, Commissioner Driehaus in her briefings uh, showed where uh, even with all that we have been putting toward this, that there still needed more work to be done. Uh, because when they look at the neighborhoods by zip code, uh, we saw that the majority of people who are getting as Hyde Park, Madeira, Indian Hill, Blue Ash, and Montgomery. Um, and that uh, in those areas, less than 7% of African Americans live there, even though African Americans are dying um, at a higher rate percentage wise. And so uh, at that briefing, it, uh, it was acknowledged that work still needs to be done. Some of the lower neighborhoods are East Price Hill, Wind Terrace, Camp Washington, English Woods, East Westwood, villages of Rogue Hill. Um, and those areas, uh, the way that we're set up with our health commission, every city that has its own, we, we don't have the jurisdiction to really go into. Uh, and as you can see that these with the lowest are in in the city, although all of us are elected countywide. Next slide. So um, got a call by uh, Cincinnati NAACP President Joe Mallory. People had been calling the NAACP trying to find and figure out ways that they've called so many other groups, uh, Urban League, et cetera, trying to figure out how do we connect to the vaccine. 
and also got a call from a pastor, uh, Dr. Uh, Brian Walker of Walker Funeral Home. So when the people die, uh, he has been doing, he said his increase at funerals have been unbelievable. And while, you know, he is a business, he does not want that uh, continuing. He's also lost a, uh, uh, a relative and a worker to COVID-19. And he has seen the death certificates that say COVID-19 as the reason for African-Americans. And as he has uh, people who are family members, he wanted to make sure that we prevent that. So we had a uh, press conference from grassroots people, from people that when we talk about equity, these are people that's there. They, these are the groups of people we're talking about. And they say, why can't we have a one-stop mobile unit? We highlighted Hampton University because they were one of the first in the country that I'm aware of that had a actual mobile bus. It's an RV, it's, you'll see it in a minute, has all the technology, it's one-stop. It was designed by their students and the vice president of research who is on in a minute, we'll hear from her. Um, and so it was designed to by African-Americans to go into African-American and low and underserved communities uh, to make sure that they have access to uh, health, uh, health services, including testing and vaccination. Next slide. Raw data. Uh, governor in uh, down here in Hamlin County shows a racial disparity in delivering vaccinations into certain neighborhoods and former state rep Alicia Reese, who you know, wants the state to help bring about a mobile van, a vaccine bus that would go into black neighborhoods block by block. She'd like to have it operating in April. Do you find that to be feasible and, and how might the state help? I've talked to Alicia about this. Uh, she and I've known each other for for a long, a long time. She served. Uh, she and my son Pat served on city council together, and uh, she's she's a friend, and uh, she's absolutely right. It needs to be done. Next slide. So we had the governor um, who controls the uh, amount of vaccine we get. So you can't have a, a bus if he says, I'm not going to give you the vaccine. And he has said that uh, he wants to get this done and work with us. And certainly, uh, hopefully after today, our administrative team can work with his team to, uh, he's already said that we will do the, get the vaccine uh, available to this. And he's also indicated that they're in the near future, uh, will probably be reducing the registration component, which has been a, a major hassle and allow some walk up. So we would be prepared when the walk up opportunities come. Oakland, California, my good friend, Councilwoman Treva Reed out of Oakland, they are a test case for the country and they already have walk up. So they're ahead of us. And that's kind of what probably will be coming to our to our state and our county. So Hampton University, Hampton University has a one-stop mobile tech tech bus. So it's uh, it has COVID testing, has vaccination, it has pharmacy, laboratory, Wi-Fi, touchscreen computers. When they go in, you say, oh, register, we can register you right there on the bus uh, with the touch, touch screens that's on the outside of the bus. A retractable awning, um, a minus 20 degree freezer. So the freezing that we need for the vaccine is inside, ready to go. It can hold large amounts. Uh, uh, a minus 80 degree freezer, a backup generator. So it already you know, has generation itself. Uh, it has filtration system. Um, it has a chair that can take uh, blood if we need to. If it's out, everything's automatic. They can do examination, have examination table. So when COVID is over, we can go inside the bus. It can keep going. And it has multi-use, which is important. After COVID, we still, people are still dying from these health disparities. It doesn't end when COVID leaves us. So this will, uh, and you can see how the at the bottom it retracts at the at the back it retracts and it goes in, goes out. Um, and I had a chance to go to Virginia because I wanted to see it myself. I went to Hampton University, I toured the bus, I went on the bus, I saw what they put together, uh, and they also had uh, their uh, uh, the governor's staff was there and and when I got there and let me say that the outside of this bus, it also makes a statement. It draws attention. When it pulls up, people say, oh my God, what is that? They come to us versus us trying to run them down. Uh, next. So 
what we're proposing today is more than a bus. It's more than a bus. It's not just a bus on wheels. We say, oh, what about a bus? It's not just a bus. Uh, we just heard from Sorta, uh, and that's Metro, that's a bus. It has the seats and it's a bus. You have to have CDL license. So that's a bus. This is not just a bus. This is designed to restore confidence in public health and bring economic resources to the community. Um, and again, the, the name that we're recommending is the, to have it called the Hamilton County Equity and Resources Mobile Tech Bus to bring equity to Hamilton County residents in health and economics through a multi-purpose tech mobile bus. Uh, this bus has all the technology and bells and whistles. The Hamilton County Equity and Resource Mobile Tech Bus um, would be designed to be multi-purpose with a focus on testing, vaccination, screening, pharmacy, technology, economic resources, but not limited to that. Um, it will uh, bring needed resources to underserved communities through a grassroots partnership. That's a key thing when we talk about equity, we got to have the grassroots, um, the people that we're trying to serve, we got to figure out, well, you know, how do you want it? How do we bring it to you? What, what, what's going to get your attention? How do we help you uh, through grassroots partnerships to address health and economic disparities? Next slide. So with that, uh, we've been um, trying to do our homework and uh, I want to thank uh, my, my staff, uh, my uh, chief of staff, Quinton Monroe and, and Edgar Malcolm uh, and working with uh, Commissioner Dumas and Commissioner Driehaus's staff as well. Um, and we have really reached out. <clears throat> We've reached out to Kroger's uh, and I would like to say that Kroger's and I'll submit it, uh, email Kroger's has committed to helping with staffing they won't be the only one with staffing, but they committed to helping with staffing and committed to um, a minimum of $20,000 contribution toward this. So we have a public private partnership. Uh, we've met with, uh, talked with the governor. And again, we've talked about getting access to the vaccine. If you don't have a vaccine, you don't have anything. So he controls the vaccine. And if he say, let's get it done and he's gonna be providing the vaccine, that's a great partnership. We've also uh, met with uh, UC Health CEO, Richard Lofgren. Uh, UC Health has said they're in, they wanna partner with us. Uh, so once the resolution get passed, we wanna move forward with them um, if possible. Um, United Way, uh, Maura Weir says, hey, we're ready, we're in. We wanna help partner when we talk about this bus having access to other uh, partners. Uh, Urban League of Greater Cincinnati, CEO Eddie. Cohen, um, and you're going to hear from Cinnamon Pelly in a few minutes, who called in to support it. Uh, certainly all of the things that they have available, they see themselves being able to also partner with the bus. Walker Funeral Home, uh, who is a pastor and actually a funeral home that has been unfortunately burying these folks that have been uh, hit by COVID in our community. Uh, is on as well and says they would love to partner. The bus can pull up there and they can help other families not have to get COVID uh, and help with other health things. We can be very creative with this uh, mobile unit. And the health gap who has said that, hey, this is something that we need and they could certainly uh, utilize it and have other ways they could partner with as they their mission is closing the health gap. Uh, we reached out to CMHA who has said, uh, they have been saying this um, for some time because, again, those are their areas. We're talking wind terrace. We're talking about going into English Woods. And let me say that when I was campaigning, I went up to English Woods. They have a new name now. When I was growing up, it's English Woods. Had a lot of friends grew up at, coming out of there as I grew up on the West Side, too. And we had people who couldn't read, but they didn't want to tell people, grown people, they couldn't read. They needed a trusted person that they wouldn't laugh at them, um, they would feel comfortable talking to. So this allows us to have partners that could go in that have the trust of the community um, and be able to help with those services. Reached out to, uh, we have support from Hamilton County Sheriff's Office, Sheriff Charmaine McGuffey. There was a question about where would we park it. We actually went to her first to see if she had, uh, because they do have an RV. Uh, but because she checked it legally, she was willing to do it, but legally we couldn't because it was bought with um, Homeland Security dollars. And so they're not able to uh, use that. Uh, but she has indicated that they have plenty of parking uh, for us in a secured way where the uh, mobile uh, unit could park if we, 
if we need it. So these are just a few of the partners that uh, we have uh, reached out to. Uh, and everyone said we like to partner. We also reached out to the Free Store Food Bank to see how we could combine maybe food. So when you get, I want a one stop. When you get there, if you need economic resources, you can hit this button and your 513 relief, we got it on the screen. You hit it, you've already applied. You got your vaccination. If you need a screening, you got screening. If you need a test, you got testing. And we've got all of that in one. If you need food, we got you covered. Um, and I think that that would be something that would be um, have multiple use and will be around even as COVID leaves. But COVID, unfortunately, we're going to need a booster shot is what we're telling, what, what, I'm, what we're told. So there'll be another round next year that we'll be trying to get out and get people the booster shot, like a flu shot. Um, and so this is um, what we're trying to do. Now, in the um, resolution, we do indicate that we like to try to get moving on this and be able to uh, move forward if possible with a goal of Minority Health Month, which is next month. Um, we have also had conversations, and Jeff was on those conversations, uh, along with other partners with um, the manufacturer of the actual, so they can ask all the technical questions and the, the, the manufacturer is available to answer those um, as well. Um, and then also uh, the resolution, we made it broad enough to allow the um, administration to have some flexibility, but also not too long. So we don't have like with the health gap, you know, they get a contract in 2017 and they come back in 2021 or like the, um, like we doing with the uh, disparity study uh, approved in July of last year. And we're still talking about, we just hitting the ground. We, this is, has to be moving expeditiously, like uh, President Joe Biden said, let's throw everything we can to fight this COVID and we got to move quick. Uh, the governor said, let's throw everything we can and we got to move quick. And if we can get a vaccine, Johnson & Johnson, um, all of the other ones, Pfizer, if they can come up with a vaccine, we can come up with a bus. Uh, so I would hope that we can move this expeditiously like we do on some other things that we have that are uh, priorities. So that is what's in the, um, this is kind of what it is. Um, I'd like to have, um, if you don't mind, I'd like to have, because she was great to host, uh, host me down there. And she was very complimentary of Hamilton County uh, and what we're doing. She researched us. She was very excited to have uh, our leadership uh, here in Hamilton County and host me down there, Dr. Uh, Michelle Penn Marshall, who is the vice president for research and the dean of the graduate college of Hampton University in Virginia. Um, and I'd like for her to say a few words on uh, sustainability and what they've been able to see. This is not their first mobile uh, bus. They've had a mobile clinic before. Uh, she'll talk about that for, it has been in existence for 20 years. This is the second one because it has all the technology. Uh, Dr. Penn Marshall. Yes, good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Wonderful. Good afternoon, President Dumas, Vice President Reese, Commissioner Drehas, and County Administrator Aluto. I do hope I pronounced your name correctly, sir. I'm Michelle Penn Marshall, as Commissioner Reese said, and I do bring you greetings from our university president of 43 years, Dr. William R. Harvey. I wanted to share, Dr. President Harvey is an astute businessman. At Hampton University, our endowment has grown 866% since he has been president. So sometimes people are concerned or they think, oh, you have extra money. That's how you can build things and do things. No, it's because he's a fundraiser. It's because he is very prudent and judicious in his spending. And he commands, sometimes demands, the same thing from us. But I joined the faculty in the School of Nursing in 2007 at Hampton University, and they have been operating a mobile health clinic for more than 20 years. They received funding to do that from the Kellogg Foundation and subsequent funding to sustain it from HRSA. And that mobile health unit provided health care to the city's citizens in the cities of Hampton and Newport News. There were many persons who were homeless. They provided um, food. They provided clothing, but they provided education 
and diabetes care, wound treatment, wound care, um, some cancer screenings, blood pressure checks, physicals. And I remember as the non-nurse and nursing, my background is in community nutrition. I remember seeing people that would be cold outside and they would wait in the line and they were expecting, we came at eight o'clock in the morning, 7.30 in the mornings on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And they would be there waiting for that mobile unit to appear because they knew that they were going to get health care that they didn't have access to and even food and clothing. So what I want you all to also note is that our current mobile unit, which was designed by Hampton University faculty and staff. Um, we designed it. I wanted that unit to be a whole lab that Mr. Looney can tell you. It took us a little while longer because it, initially I turned it into a molecular lab because my background is also in biology. I turned it into a molecular lab and had the whole mobile unit looking that way, just like our physical lab in a building. And the president said to me, we were almost at the end of the design. He said, Michelle, do you think we really need to collect samples in this mobile unit, PCR samples, or take them back to the lab? I said, sir, you're right. So then we came back and redesigned it. Mr. Looney and his team worked with us. So while it would take 45 days now to have something like this up and running because we designed the prototype, we've kind of gotten all of the little, um, I guess we debugged it and all the thoughts that people have in their mind. I think it's a very good prototype. So it has a lab on the inside in the very back. When you see it expand, that's so that you have more room to be in that molecular laboratory part. And you also can close that off from the front part where people are, where the, bar um, the bariatric chair is that's um, electric, where that is in the front. So that, some of the things, there's a restroom inside. Uh, you can fit tables and chairs because we know you can't vaccinate 250 people in one day on a mobile unit, getting people on and off. But you can put tents out, which can fit underneath the mobile unit. You can put tables and chairs out. Because of the Wi-Fi capability, you can register everyone. We use PrepMod in Virginia, the electronic health record. So that won't be problematic at all. It can also be very easily repurposed. Two of the last things I want to share with you is, I am from rural, a rural county in Virginia a very rural county, lovely people. They embraced us when we moved there. And for rural and underserved communities, it is a challenge to get health care. You have one or two physicians in the whole community. Everyone does not have a vehicle. And I hope you have seen the article that was published in the Washington Post on the 22nd. And the title of the article is, Without a Ride, Many in Need Have No Shot at Coronavirus Vaccine. I want to quote, millions of older adults and low-income people of color who are at higher risk of contracting the virus don't have cars, don't drive, or don't live near public transportation. Some are homebound. Some live in rural areas far from vaccination sites. It is incredibly complicated how the vaccine planning played out across the country. Transportation was overlooked. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I just want to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Penn Marshall for just opening up to us and allowing us to, you know, not have to recreate the wheel and uh, just been so helpful um, to us and certainly thank you and uh, your president uh, for hosting me and allowing me to see it and go in and all those things. And so we really appreciate that. I do want to reiterate that this, uh, the mobile bus is not to take away from what we have uh, been doing. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we were in the churches, we're doing um, different uh, pop-ups. It's not to stop those things. It's just to add to what we've been doing and then have something that's more long-term when this is over and when the, the news is on a different news cycle, uh, people of color will still be grappling with these health disparities. And I think certainly our board has said in the past that we want to tackle these things. And this allows us the opportunity through partnerships, public-private partnerships, organization partnerships. The community um, allows us to go into different places, do different things, be creative, and have something that's um, a little more longer-term sustainable. So um, that is uh, our presentation, um, Madam President. Uh, 
we do have the resolution. Uh, there are some people I know uh, that uh, I heard their names, so I know they're on the call. So however you want to handle that, I will uh, stop here. Thank you. I'd like to open it up to the other people that are on the line to make comments uh, from the public. Thanks, Madam uh, President. Up first, we have Cinnamon Pelly. Cinnamon, you are unmuted on my end. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh oh, sounds like I'm going. I got a nice echo there. <laughs> All right, Cinnamon, I'm unmuting your other audio. Looks like you're on there twice. Um, Cinnamon, we might need you to log off and log back on because you were on there twice. Um, and how about let's go to our next guest, Dr. Brian Walker. Hey, I'm here. Oh, thank you, Cinnamon. You had the uh, pleasure of addressing the board for two minutes. Thanks. Okay, wonderful. Hi, I'm Cinnamon. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the Urban League of Greater Southwestern Ohio. And I just want to speak in support of the launch of this one-stop resource mobile tech bus. As uh, uh, Commissioner Reese and Dr. Penn Marshall have talked about, the need for testing and access to vaccines continues in the community, particularly in African-American and other underserved communities where the negative impact of COVID infection has taken a significant and disproportionate toll. Um, the Urban League through community-based partnerships continues to offer weekly COVID testing, and we've connected more than 500 people to vaccine appointments. We continue to hear that um, those that are interested in the vaccine struggle with securing an appointment. Uh, a lot of the reasons and barriers are attributed to transportation and the digital divide, uh, particularly for our seniors that have to navigate technology to register and secure appointments. Um, so in order to ensure more equitable access to COVID release, we really need to uh, remove these barriers. And we believe that by taking these resources to the community, it'll help um, reach uh, underserved communities by eliminating some of the major obstacles to access. Um, again, I'm here to speak in support of the launch of this mobile tech bus, um, not only for now, but in the future to continue to deliver relief and resources for communities that need it most. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Commissioner, we have Dr. Brian Walker. Dr. Walker, you are unmuted on my end. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. <clears throat> uh, my name is Dr. Brian Walker. I'm a pastor of Bethel Baptist Church <clears throat> in Walnut Hills. Uh, with that being said, pastor, preacher, I try not to talk too much. So um, I'm coming twofold as a pastor and uh, for Walker Funeral Home. Uh, the pastor side, I, I pastor an older conger, African-American congregation um, with the average ages between, uh, my average age is about 50. Um, but before I go there, I want to thank Commissioner Reese. You know, we've been talking some time and our funeral home, we have been open. We have never closed uh, with this pandemic. Uh, with that being said, our staff, uh, we have been dealing with the public. And so uh, we were not considered frontline workers. And so I'm thankful with the efforts of, of Commissioner Reese that now my staff, we are, we have gotten the vaccine shot. Um, even myself, I was able to get the vaccine shot. I get my second shot this Thursday. So first of all, I want to thank you uh, for your efforts that now my staff can have the vaccine. So um, with my congregation, we have, we have had to close our church because of um, COVID. And so uh, we are trying to do the mask, the hand sanitizer. And so um, thankful with the efforts that we were able to get the shot as far as in churches. The problems that we've, we've ran into, we had to kind of create a customer service because some of our older members, number one, do not have transportation. And the ones that had transportation, they had a hard time registering. And so it took a lot of time and effort, not only with the, our church, but also with the funeral home. We had to create a, a customer service to help our elderly people um, even register. And so um, talking to Commissioner Reese, you know, that was one of the, the things that she was concerned about and I was concerned about as well. So with the mobile uh, tech bus, I, I'm, I'm, I'm praying, you know, our, our congregation is praying because um, some of us, are, um, we were very intimidated with uh, even registering. And so that's, that's number one on the, the pastor side. So we have opened up. We've tried to register people. And so uh, another issue is transportation. Some of our elderly saints or elderly people have no way to get to the hospital, still have fear uh, about going out. So um, it's just a grand idea that if they can't come to us, we can come to them. That's on the church side. Now, on the funeral side, 
Um, we were trying to get some some raw statistics as far as where we're at with the death certificates. And so um, in our statistics in the early part of the year and end of the year, normally uh, we, we track our deaths. And we have uh, normally around the beginning of the year in December, I don't know if it's because it's Christmas, because it's the new year, um, our, our funerals are low. We have now this year and uh, later part of this year have averaged 200 um, funerals. And uh, the early part of the year, we were at 40%, and that, that of death certificates is going as far as the COVID virus. And we've tracked it to say that now that trend is going up, that deaths are coming from COVID. Now, we're an African-American community um, funeral home, but we have about 20% Caucasian. And so when we look at the statistics of deaths, it's not as high in uh, the Caucasian as far as the COVID, as far as death certificates, but we've seen a tremendous rise in the African-American community. With, with COVID. Unfortunately, with our community, we have had pre-existing conditions. And because of the pre-existing conditions and COVID, we've seen a lot of deaths. Um, I've had staff that have passed away from COVID. Um, I had two staff members that were in their 50s. I had my uncle. He, he was uh, in good health, uh, but he passed away from COVID. And so, again, um, we're seeing the rise. We, we know it's a concern. And so, uh, the Walker family, Walker Funeral Home, Bethel Baptist Church, we're really in support of this mobile attack it, um, bus is, is needed. Uh, it's a cry on both ends. You know, with funerals, or we suggest that we want to do um, celebration. Uh, and we see that many people are calling um, our uh, funeral home to get help. And they don't have, and we don't have the resources to get to them. So, that's why we, we're very uh, much supportive of this, this bus that we can get to our community, and we're willing to do whatever it takes uh, from the church standpoint to the funeral uh, standpoint, uh, funeral home standpoint, whatever we can do to help our community. Not only that, just I'm almost through, but I also like the fact that it's needed not only for uh, the COVID but the aftermath. In our community, we no longer have a, a Kroger's, and so um, we're trying to do our best to feed the, our community and in, in our city in the Hamilton County. Uh, but we're limited. So I know um, going forward, um, partnering uh, uh, with the city in order to help our community, uh, not only with resources and food, uh, we're in full support of. So thank you for allowing me to, to say my, my little piece. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Walker. Um, and we have a couple more um, people that would like to speak. Uh, if you can limit your comments to two minutes, that would be great. Uh, the mayor of Woodline, uh, Brian Poole. Are you there, Mr. Poole? May okay. Maybe I just see him at the bottom. He just there. Here. He is. He's he's unmuted on my end, so he we just need to unmute. There he is. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, ladies and uh, commissioners. How are we this afternoon? Great. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good. 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 Just want to uh, briefly just touch base on the uh, conversation today. Has just been awesome. Got to. Uh, hear what Dr. Uh, Penn Marshall had to say, Dr. Walker, good stuff. Um, I just wanted to just dive in and just really talk about uh, the partnership where we allowed uh, to come together in Woodlawn for what we call the trial run of the 60 doses. And it showed me as a mayor um, that we need more and we need more beyond um, the, the walls of the pandemic, um, bringing this health ban, this mobile tech ban beyond COVID, it's just something that excites me. Our residents are uh, constantly calling the village office asking when we're coming back. So hopefully we can come back uh, for the vaccination in a bigger, stronger uh, volume. It was very successful. Um, but again, I just support and want this, uh, and want this uh, initiative to really just jump off. I think it's a wonderful idea, wonderful idea that we, uh, um, Commissioner, you have the eye opportunity to go down to Hampton to see this firsthand. So good stuff. So again, I just support this. And I think that, again, it just gives us the, um, the ability to serve our, our community at a better level. So I just thank you for allowing me to speak today. Um, and everyone, thanks again. Thank you, sir. Um, we have You're welcome. Uh, Renee Mahaffey Harris of Closing the Health Gap. Renee, you are unmuted on my end. So, 
sometimes star six also will help you unmute on a, on a telephone. Okay. There she is. All right. Well, um, so first of all, I want to thank all three commissioners, our President Summerall Dumas, Summer, uh, President Driehaus, and, and President Reese, I mean, not President Reese, but Vice President Reese for moving forth to create this opportunity for our county. Um, you know, the report that you funded uh, that enabled us to understand the impact of COVID-19 on black and brown people in this county, um, you know, just illuminates the reason for the need for Hamilton County Equity Resources Mobile Tech Bus. Um, not only will we be able to meet people where they are and bringing that mobile unit to um, community residents who are homebound or who have no transportation, but will also as a post strategy be able to address some of the barriers that um, have an impact on the continued disparities in our country and in our county, such as delivering um, testing for blood pressure and cholesterol and preventative care, delivering child vac childhood vaccinations for school and flu shots, as well as the second round of uh, vaccination that we will all need in a year. So I very much believe that anything that we can do to remove the barriers to access and that we can meet our residents throughout this county where they are um, is something that the health gap um, and the collaborations we have with our hospital systems, including UC Health and others, um, will really enable us to, frankly, be able to contract medical services that can be more easily disseminated throughout our county. So I am very much in support of anything that will enable us to create greater access. And so this equity and resources mobile tech bus and the expertise shared from Hampton um, and uh, the work that um, continues to be done to remove barriers will be greatly impacted by this equity resource mobile tech bus. So I stand um, in support and um, have provided some information as to how, as we remove barriers, we make the accessibility and removing the hesitancy of access from a transportation perspective to our Hamilton County residents. So I thank each of the commissioners, I thank Commissioner Reese in particular for taking the leadership and moving forward to make this resolution possible today. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, next we have Joe Mallory, the president of the NAACP. Can you hear me? Yes. We hear you now, Joe. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to speak before this esteemed uh, commission. Um, I was on a, uh, a panel about a month ago, maybe a month ago with uh, Alicia Reese and Commissioner Reese and Governor DeWine. And I posed a question, you know, and I said the same thing during the testing uh, for COVID. I said, why can't we have a mobile unit that goes to the communities to meet people who have accessibility issues, meet them where they are? And, um, and I'm, I'm glad to see that Commissioner Reese has come up with this model that she found with the Hampton University model, because I speak in support of that mobile unit. Because many times in the, in the black community, you know, we get lip service and window dressing when it talks about equity and the demographics that they are trying to reach out to. And I believe this is an opportunity that we can leave no one behind and meet them where they are, you know, as it relates to the uh, mobility and technology disadvantaged you know, particularly as it relates to the accessibility issue. And, you know, we can always make these bold statements, you know, that we believe in uh, equity, that we think that racism is a public health crisis, but you, you gotta mean it by with showing it with actions. And in NACP, we get calls continually from people frustrated, trying to figure out how they can get registered for an appointment. And, you know, thank goodness we have some organizations that we can feed the, the names and the information to the people because they get frustrated trying to get through the, to the system that's been set up. It's automated. They can't talk to a real live person. And there's, I know, I know that we were kind of like uh, building this airplane as we we're flying and the things were kind of in flux, but there's frustration because they also say in the black community, uh, a lot of blacks didn't want to get the shot. There was apprehension, there was skepticism, but the problem was a supply problem. There's a lot of blacks that want to get the shot. They're trying to figure out how to get the shot. And they call us asking us how they get an appointment. And that was a problem. Some, a lot of them have uh, issues with transportation. 
And then when they get frustrated, you know what they'll do? They'll give up. They will give up. And I think it's a time that this, this type of opportunity for the Hampton University model, those type of resources being expended, you know, for that particular model is not too much to ask. You know, it will be significant and it will be transformative because, you know, a lot of times we talk about price tags, we can't afford it, or, you know, let's just give you a Band-Aid, you know, we'll give you uh, a station wagon or a, a van and go out to the communities and, and oh, well, they didn't show up, you know, we didn't get a lot of, you know, a lot of support and a lot of people showing up. This, this model will last and it could be used for multiple purposes to address these barriers that exist, you know, in the community. So I don't want to take up all your time. You know, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I am speaking as the president of the Cincinnati NAACP, and I believe that this this will be a message that you will send that you are listening to the least of us out here in the underserved and the under-resourced community. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, and now we have uh, Aaron Brown. I believe he's a council person uh, in Lincoln Heights. I could be wrong. Aaron, are you on? In Forest Park, council. council. Oh, in Forest Park, correct. Thank you. Can, you. can you hear me? Yes, we hear you now. All right. Uh, well, thank you, commissioners, for allowing me the opportunity to speak today. Uh, thank you for the invitation, Commissioner Reese. And um, thank you to, to uh, Joe Mallory for even the, the nugget of this idea. Um, uh, as you mentioned, my name is Aaron Brown. I am a uh, city council member in Forest Park. Obviously, I'm not speaking on behalf of the, the city, but I am speaking about uh, on behalf of myself as a citizen and resident in Hamilton County. Um, just to echo a lot of what has been said today, I think the accessibility of a, of a bus would be um, paramount to making sure vaccine gets directly to people. I know there is a, a level of skepticism and um, underserved communities when it comes to uh, the medical uh, uh, institution. However, uh, we know that COVID is not the flu. We know that even though people are being vaccinated and things are opening back up, um, there is still a need for people to be vaccinated. And I know in particular in Forest Park, um, the accessibility and capacity piece uh, of this, this uh, mobile bus is, is very important considering um, its direct engagement to the people. Um, Forest Park is predominantly African-American, but it's also very diverse. We have uh, people from uh, Nepal. So there's a very robust Nepalese community. And there's also a lot of people from um, South American countries and Central American countries like Mexico and Guatemala. So I think um, reducing barriers like um, uh, if people may not have are able to get into their primary care physician, having a uh, an additional piece um, like a bus um, that can get directly to people is, is supplemental. And a lot of times uh, people think they necessarily uh, equate the, the suburbs with affluence um, and they might focus resources towards inner city communities. But we have to, we have to realize that um, poverty is out in the suburbs as well. Um, but then also um, there are countywide resources that can be extended to communities just like Forest Park. So, but I think the, one of the most important and kind of overlooked uh, parts here is the educational piece. Um, because there are still funding that the county has um, from the CARES Act that we can inform people about, like rent and utility assistance through things such as the bus. So if they're not able to get to, um, if they're not able to get down to, you know, community action agency or something, um, pamphlets can be uh, distributed on the bus while people are getting informed and tested and vaccinated for COVID. So uh, I think it just has to be a, a very holistic approach. Um, but once again, I, I just want to thank everybody for the opportunity, um, and I'm in full support of this uh, uh, initiative. So thank you. Thank you so much. And I have Susan Biltz. Susan, are you on the line? I am. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, I would like to thank all my uh, speakers before us because basically they summarize pretty much everything I have mentioned. I'm a teacher of 32 years. I've been blessed to teach in several neighborhoods, including Quarryville, Price Hill, and the West End. And this year, more than ever, we have seen firsthand how neighborhoods with limited accessibility to health care and other resources could benefit from a mobile tech bus as the one Commissioner Reese is proposing. 
Many people in the black and brown communities have confided in me that they need more education about the current COVID vaccination. They are fearful about it. Many of my students have told me this, or they, there isn't enough opportunities or accessibilities when they are interested to get the shot in several neighborhoods. They, as mentioned before, difficulty in registering has been an issue, or again, lack of transportation to get to the much needed healthcare opportunities. This mobile tech bus could help educate many neighborhoods, provide Wi-Fi to access much needed resources and train healthcare professionals as well as expose our neighborhoods to job opportunities in healthcare. And as mentioned before, you know, give the COVID vaccinations and screenings. The biggest obstacles many educators and city agencies have found is there are communities that lack transportation, Wi-Fi to enable people to get connected to the resources such as healthcare, People are in need of aid for paying utility and food bills, and they are requesting education to calm people's fears during this pandemic and providing screening opportunities and COVID tests as well. I think this mobile unit could be a godsend to many communities who could benefit in many ways. We all know if we want people to come out, you bring these units to the churches and to the schools. Some schools have clinics, others don't. The fact that Kroger has agreed to partner with this program is phenomenal. We have found during COVID groups such as Grandma's Kitchen and District 3 have partnered in delivering food and other much needed resource to, to the communities who have limited transportation. We went to them. We have done so much as a city and a county, but we can do so much more. And this mobile tech bus can complement the smaller units we already have. Thanks for all of you that you've done so much for our city and our county. We are thankful for one family in particular, when they had nowhere else to go, I came to you and you two of the commissioners stepped up and helped us get them the resources they needed to pay their bills and provide their food. A mobile, a mobile unit could continue to bring many of our families these much needed resources. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Um, we have Viola Brown, if she's on the line. Viola, you are unmuted on my end. And it looks like you're unmuted. Muted now. She's unmuted. It doesn't look like we're able to hear her. And then finally, I'm not sure, we have one more phone number on the line. It's 717-790-2919. Uh, um, would you like to uh, speak to the board? I've just unmuted you on my end. Oh, and here we go. Let's, uh, Viola's back with us. Viola has her hand raised. Viola, you are unmuted. See if your audio works. We yeah, unfortunately, I don't think it works. We don't see her on the, oh, there she is. Sounds like I hear some. Um, Viola, would you like to put something in the chat since we can't hear you? And we can go to the commissioners and then you can come up after we're done. That sounds like a good plan. Okay. Um, well, Bridget, let me know if she comes back up. Um, Will do. Okay. Um, Can you I, hear me? Oh, yes. Now we hear you. Yes. Uh-huh. I do apologize. Thank you very much for your patience. Oh, that's uh, okay. First of all, uh, hello, my name is Viola Brown, and I will be speaking on behalf of the seniors. Um, I'd like to thank the Board of Commissioners for hearing me. And uh, basically, I would like to reiterate that the COVID-19 one-stop resource mobile tech bus would be very beneficial because seniors are often neglected when it comes to having the availability or resources to participate in or receive certain services. Uh, some of our seniors even have a fear 
of going out in the public. And having this mobile bus can alleviate the stress and concern of these seniors, as well as provide meaningful health care as a convenience. Uh, Commissioner Reese, along with all others, will be helping to ensure that tools are used to reach and meet those in our community by educating and providing a much needed service. We desperately need this bus to make a difference. So I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Ms. Brown. You're welcome. Okay. I don't see anyone else. Um, do you see anyone else, Bridget? Uh, I do not, except for this telephone number, but it does not seem like they're unmuting on their end. Okay. So I believe we are, uh, public comment is finished. Thank you so much. Um, at this point, um, Commissioner uh, Driehaus, if you have any comments. Thanks, Madam President. Thanks to all those who spoke um, this afternoon. It's it's very helpful to hear from the public on all things. Um, so, I, you know, this um, bus um, idea is one that was brought forward, um, I, I guess, a couple of weeks ago. I, I, we didn't have a formal document in front of us, but we had heard the idea. And so um, my initial blush was, wait a minute, we're already doing this. Um, you know, because we have been working on this issue of equity uh, for a while now, because we know what has been said by all, which is that COVID-19 has not been fair when it comes to um, the death count and those impacted most by the virus. And so we um, last year wanted to try to work on this issue and bring some equity um, to our testing efforts and our distribution of vaccine efforts. And so in November, we purchased three vans, as we all know, um, through the Department of Public Health and uh, that was through our CARES Act dollars. And those vans were intended to go distribute vaccine to um, pop-up sites, brick and mortar pop-up sites primarily throughout the county in areas that were hard to reach. And, and also areas that had seen a very high rate of COVID-19. And so that was primarily their function. Um, one of them then was utilized a few weeks ago as a pop-up outside of a brick and mortar. We, we did the pop-up literally outside the van, they have awnings on them, so they're capable of doing that. And um, some vaccine was distributed uh, through that mobile unit. And so, um, you know, we have made that investment, you know, uh, Commissioner Kesterman is careful about where those vans go. And so that was my first blush response to this. And also our equity numbers um, were the second best in the state. That is not to say that we're doing great. It's, it's around 14% of African-Americans are getting the vaccine, but it is true to say, and, and Commissioner Reese showed the slide where if you just open up a system and allow people to um, go and try to get vaccine, you know, th there are many distribution points, including the hospitals, the FQACs, the public health departments, and there is inequity in that. There, it's built in. And so you have to be intentional about this other piece. And so that's what we have been trying to do through public health. And so, but as I've, you know, as this resolution has um, changed and it has uh, become more broad in the um, language around the use of the bus, um, I am reminded about the um, resolution that we passed last year declaring racism a public health crisis. And can see how this bus in its life now or you know immediate life but then beyond perhaps fits into the idea that we can do better whether it's um, health disparities or information related to economic development or, or or whatever i mean there there can be a life beyond just the vaccine distribution and so, um, and I, and I, and so I, I did um, offer some concerns about timing here too, because it did take uh, public health, I think it was a couple of months to get just these vans um, outfitted so that they could be mobile units. And so there is a timing element here that um, I had raised as a question um, as to whether or not the bus would even be ready uh, in order to distribute vaccine as we continue to see, you know, the ramp up there. but. The, from what I understand now and, and from what I read from the resolution, it is vaccine distribution and um, some of these other things that are listed out in the resolution. And so I, you know, I'm inclined to support this 
because I think um, the long-term vision is something that fits in with um, the direction this commission is headed in. And I think frankly, the direction that our, our county is headed in. Um, so I, I have a couple of questions, just they're not so much technical, rather um, I'm trying to understand kind of um, the broad aspect of the bus itself, um, because in the resolution, there is some recognition, recognition that there would be partners that would be engaged here um, as the bus is utilized throughout the community. And, so, and, and, this, and the bus also will not be um, under the purview of uh, Hamilton County P Public Health or the City Public Health, rather something else. And so I'm, I'm trying to better understand that. Um, and so I guess this is a, um, a question for Commissioner Reese. So who would be responsible for operating the bus and really um, the overall, I guess, programming of the bus, um, which entities would be in partnership and then literally the programming as it moves around throughout the community? Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Commissioner Driehouse. Uh, for, for your work. And I think that one of the things we both agree when um, obviously and you said this yourself too, um, we are number two in the state and you were like, that's not good enough. We want to be number one. Um, and then as I've talked to the governor, you know, our state isn't even number one. So we're number one of a state that's not number one. So certainly the state we both agree has a lot of work to, to do. Um, when I researched this, uh, when it was brought to me by actually uh, NAACP President Joe Mallory, uh, you're absolutely right. I reached out to um, our health commissioner who's been doing a good job and I under now understand the structure of our health commission, which a lot of people don't know. Um, one, we don't control the health commission. We don't make any board appointments. Uh, it basically does a lot of an arm of the state. As unlike at the city of Cincinnati, where we appoint the board members, we control the budget, we have a lot more say when I was on city council. Um, and then there's jurisdictional um, uh, situations. So when I talked with um, Commissioner Kesterman about the uh, mobile vans that were purchased, the first thing I saw, they were purchased in November, uh, but even in the presentation and even on Facebook, the first place that it went to December 23rd of 2020 was the city of Reading. Uh, so it wasn't basically dealing with the equity issue. It wasn't bought for that purpose or designed for that purpose. Um, and so it went to Reading, Ohio first. And I think the only African-American place that has gone as a pop-up van has been Woodlawn, which he asked me, uh, where should we go? Uh, we can try to go somewhere. So we went to Woodlawn as a tester. But one of the things that he indicated to me was, um, where should I go? But I can't go, I have to, I can't go in the city of Cincinnati. That's exactly what he told me. So that was the first news to me, cause I didn't know, you know, I've been here about 60, 65 plus days. And I said, well, wait a minute, we're elected by the whole county. And then when I saw the data that uh, you presented at your briefing and it showed English woods and wind terrace, these very hard to serve areas. And then I got the call from Councilmember uh, Brown from Forest Park and said, hey, can we get the bus out there? Uh, and, you know, it just kind of, that's how to have it kind of got going. And so the thought was um, the administration asked us to keep it broad to give them flexibility uh, in the uh, resolution. Number one, I identified a place for the money. we had given $18 million to the Health Collaborative. Uh, they've only used $5 million. $13 million is still available. Um, my understanding is that they wanted to move into the vaccination. We got a, a memo from Jeff Aluto, who's on here, that they wanted to repurpose 1.2 million to go toward vaccine coordination. So now we're moving into coordination space. So I thought, well, heck, if you're coordinating, what are you coordinating? And they said they were dealing with the equity issue. Well, if you're dealing with the equity issue, then you're coordinating, why couldn't this bus be a part of that coordination? Um, it would allow us to be um, uh, countywide. Uh, it would allow us to have other partners that come in, like Kroger's that's ready to come in, because the health gap that's coming in, the Urban League to come in. Um, but my understanding is that the administration said we wanted to write the resolution to allow them more flexibility. So we wrote it that if, the, if it isn't the health collaborative, which I recommend, um, then maybe there's another entity that the administration may find 
Uh, but that entity must be able to partner with the grassroots partners, the NAACP, the Urban League, the um, Health Gap, uh, all of the major players as it talk when we talk about grassroots equity. So that's kind of the, that was the, the vision um, that it would allow the administration the, the flexibility uh, and not tie their hands. But I personally recommend if the health collaborative is looking to repurpose their money toward, uh, uh, toward the vaccine coordination, they're looking to talk, get into the equity space. I see a perfect place to go and expand out. So um, that's, that was the, uh, the intent of the resolution and why it is you know, broad, written broadly to allow them some flexibility. So, right, I was just wondering um, who would be responsible for operating the bus. And I'm wondering now that I've asked that question about you know, going out with an RFP to solicit um, you know, folks who would be interested in providing that service to the county. I'm not talking so much about the cost of the bus as I am the cost, or, and not even the cost, it's more of the operation of um, you know, how, how this moves forward and who's responsible. We, the last thing we want is for this not to be moving around the county. So I, that was the question. Um, the, and the other one, and you, you mentioned it, um, so you, you know, it's correct to say that Hamilton County Public Health can only work in its own jurisdiction, which is not the city of Cincinnati. Uh, and it's not Springdale and it's not Norwood either, right? And so, uh, and the city of Cincinnati is also you know, has to stay in their lane, uh, which is the city of Cincinnati. And, and they do behave very differently. Um, and so as this bus uh, moves around, because many of the neighborhoods um, that were referenced um, are city neighborhoods. And so I, I'm wondering if you've had a conversation with the city, um, whether it's the health commissioner or um, anybody else at the city, just to um, let them know that this is something that's being contemplated. And as you say, you know, as county commissioners, we're in this weird spot where we, re we represent people inside the city and outside the city because they're all in Hamilton County. Um, and so I'm just wondering what those conversations have been. Yeah, so I, I've had a, a lot of conversation in a short amount of time, as you've indicated, um, February um, was when the idea came forward to uh, Joe Mallory, and we had to find the prototype, what was out there, what's available. And in that time, I've had lots of conversations, whether it's the CEO of United Way, CEO uh, closing the health gap, the governor himself, whether it is the um, uh, Free Store Food Bank CEO, uh, the Urban League CEO, uh, NAACP president, and a number of other uh, potential part, UC Health CEO, um, a number of partners in a short amount of time. Now, um, one of the things that, uh, and I'm not telling the, you know, the administration actually how to do their job, but some things that I've seen since I've been here where they've had uh, existing contracts with someone and they say, oh, we can add a, uh, you know, we've had this amount of money talked about it. You know, we, we pay a lot of stuff. Uh, and they say, oh, we got existing contract with someone and we can just, uh, in fact, I think they're looking at right now the health collaboratives contract and seeing how they can repurpose the $1.2 million and maybe not even come back to us. So, you know, I would like for one thing about equity is to have one standard and not double standards. And sometimes I've seen um, just in some things that were presented to me, some things we move quickly on and we say, in fact, we've got a thing with the uh, soccer coming up and I'm for the World Cup, you know, I'm in tourism but we've got to make a decision quickly to agree by the 31st that we will uh, do enhancements to Paul Brown Stadium. And you know that's going to be millions of dollars. So I like for us to work as expeditiously. We've got a team of people that's ready to go. We've got $13 million sitting with the Health Collaborative. Uh, they're able to function throughout the county. They've got the city people, all the different cities, and they've got the county health commissioner. And I think uh, if it were me, that's the way I would go. I don't want to tie the hands of the administration. Um, but in the resolution, it says that we would like these partners to be able to have access to it. Um, and uh, I originally had the health collaborative in there. Uh, but again, as we try to be uh, cooperative and work together, I was asked to take that part out. Uh, so I did. Um, and so now we have questions about, well, what are you, who's going to run it? Well, for me, it would have been, part of the health collaborative as they're moving into health coordination and to bring those partners and they already have UC Health. So UC Health is ready to jump forward. We've got some money from Kroger's. 
uh, and then they're going to be putting together um, uh, vaccine coordination. And I just thought that might be a, the best place because it brings all the all the entities. But there may be another place that I'm that you may think or someone else may think would be a better place to put um, you know put the bus for the operations. But that was kind of my thinking. Uh, since they've already been meeting and working together, maybe that might be the better place. Well, I guess, so as we think through that, um, the most appropriate agency or partner um, to operate the bus, I do wonder if um, the city of Cincinnati could help inform, uh, or rather if, if we were you know, to put that out and ask who would like the opportunity to do that. Uh, I do wonder if they've had this conversation themselves. Uh, and, and I don't know that they have a mobile unit. Um, not, not that I'm aware of. They, they tend to operate out of their, I mean, they've got health clinics, they've got rec centers, they tend to be throughout the city. And so this issue of equity is maybe, I don't know if it's less relevant, but it's a little bit easier to address because they've got these smaller facilities everywhere. Whereas as a county, we just don't have that. And so we are working through community churches and, rec and, and senior centers and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I do wonder, and I, and I don't know the answer to this, if um, maybe they have thought through a little bit of this too. And so if we were to go out and say, hey, um, who would, uh, you know, again, like to respond to this opportunity, if maybe um, there are, agencies or uh, partners that they've talked to that might jump at the chance to do that and, and respond to that. So I, I don't know, I'm just kind of thinking because so much of it, um, you know, it's as you say throughout the county, but a lot of what we've been talking about is really in the city. Um, I'd be curious to know if, if they have thought through any of that. And again, I, I no, no judgment because I don't, I don't know the oh, answer. Yeah. No, 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 I think, I mean, I think those are good ideas. Uh, I will say that I talked to the CEO of CMHA and I have, I mentioned, I mean, the, the mayor of Cincinnati knows about this. So, um, and I was told that the CMHA, uh, and he's wanting to partner because these are some of his areas. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that he indicated was that it was mentioned by uh, the health uh, commissioner about a mobile and it just, you know, obviously early on a mobile. Do you, do you mean the city health commissioner? City health commissioner, yes. But the main thing I want to make sure is that we can hit the city because after this is over, after COVID, we still, I want to be able to go into Lincoln Heights. I want to be able to go into Woodlawn as well as these city, the city areas as well, be able to go into Norwood, be able to go into uh, these pockets uh, wherever the need is. So I want to make sure wherever we put it has the most flexibility. Uh, I also want to say uh, Dr. Uh, Pim Marshall has indicated that uh, one of the things that they, they've done, uh, even FEMA, has, uh, uh, they have a uh, opportunity through FEMA Mobile 5, uh, they have $54,000 that they get to vaccinate 200 people per week. So this, is, this could really be something. Oh. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't, I don't disagree. I, I, I'm, I forgive me. I'm just more focused on the long term uh, because that short term, as people have said, you know, it's really hard to get a vaccine. But that's that's about scarcity. That's about doses. I mean, it's just been incredibly challenging for people uh, to get vaccinated, and that's mostly. Res you know, a result of not having enough doses for everybody. Because as you say, people are interested in getting doses. We just need to have the capacity to do it. Um, and, and, you know, we are um, partnering with CMHA right now in some of their senior buildings with the mobile vans. So there's probably an opportunity there too. So I'm just trying to sort through um, the now of the um, vaccine distribution, but also um, as importantly, I think the long-term vision for who the partners are um, and to make sure that the operation is robust because we're making an investment here. Um, and I you know, wanna make sure that it is all that it can be and just try to um, get a better understanding of who all the partners are and who the operating partner will be in the future. So I'll look forward to, to seeing that come forward um, whenever it's available. Thank you, those Thank you. are great, great. And uh, Commissioner Greenhouse, you're talking about strategic implementation and we certainly will be depending on our administration to look at the feasibility uh, if this passes uh, of how that needs to happen. Um, just a couple comments. Um, and I'll start out with saying, with all our getting, we need to get understanding. Of course, knowledge is power. So those of you that are listening, those of you that are writing a report about our meeting today as it relates to this issue, I just wanna say loud and clear, uh, that this board has no disagreement as it relates to whether or not 
we need to provide equal access, whether or not diversity and equity needs to be the top of our, our mission, and also increasing vaccination. So there's no disagreement on this board as it relates to that. Um, and also I wanna say, um, there's just a difference of opinion. And the difference of opinion is, and that's a great thing because that's why we have three commissioners and, and not one. And so the difference of opinion is whether or not, uh, for me, is this the best option? Whether or not this is most cost effective for the taxpayers of Hamilton County. So that's what it is uh, for me, but realizing the ultimate goal is to reach the black and brown community in a better and faster way. Um, but we have the responsibility and I have the responsibility, not just as a commissioner, but as president of the board to look at options, uh, to make sure that we're being cost efficient. Uh, the money is there to be able to follow through on this resolution. So that's not uh, even the point either. But um, as I said earlier, um, to allow our administration to look at what's the best way for programming, uh, have his staff look at, look at that. Um, and I also want to let our public know that are, that are listening and those that called in that there are other mobile vans, um, some equipped with the information uh, that was given earlier, like a mammography van or a prostate van. So there are some of those out there that are larger. And then we have the smaller ones that were uh, mentioned earlier. So lastly, um, I would like to say that our goal uh, is the same. We know there's some, um, and I think um, Commissioner Driehaus, you just said about, um, it's about the scarcity, scarcity of the um, vaccines being received, uh, but it's so, you know, that's also very important, but it's so much more important to that. We know there has been, as we look at the affluent communities that have, uh, I think Madeira had like 65% of vaccinations already done. That's not okay. Um, so we need to get out there. We need to do it. We need to reach the people that can't get to us. And so it's an uh, ultimate goal of this board to make sure that that happens. Um, and so those are the only uh, comments that I have as a relationship to this. I just want the public to know, and I appreciate all the comments from the public that actually uh, you didn't have to fight for this, but it's good to fight for this. But we're all on the same page. It's just how do we make this happen? Okay, uh, that's all I have. Um, and Madam President, can I also uh -huh. have for the record, um, Nick Crosley, um, who is with our uh, Emergency Management and Homeland Security Agency. Um, he also sent an email and said that this unit can also be helpful uh, for uh, medical assistance after a disaster. Um, mm -hmm. And so with food, water, cleanup kits, and other life-saving supplies, he also said that they could provide the uh, PPE uh, things to help get out to more people through the mobile bus. And I just wanted to um, to highlight that. And then lastly, I just want to thank um, thank you both for your consideration. Um, we have tried to do as much research as we could. Um, we know that it's a short amount of time and the time is dictated really by COVID. COVID is dictating the timeline. Um, and I do want to say that it's not to say what we haven't done is, 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 is uh, we, we stop what we're doing, uh, but we also continue to find and search for other ways to continue to hit the goal. Um, and I think of people that were on today is because this is came, this came from the people. This not didn't come from me sitting at my desk and say, oh, I want to do this. Um, because as you know, I was working on the relief of God. Uh, but this came from the community. And so um, I just wanted to, I wanted to give them the, the credit, um, not me the credit um, or any of us. So when they brought it, I said, let me try to work on it. Let me see if I can find something. And again, I want to thank Dr. Uh, Penn Marshall and Hampton University, uh, which is being nationally recognized for what they are doing uh, in, uh, in Virginia. So I just wanted to thank Hampton University as well. So thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. And we need the voices of those who are being directly impacted and also those agencies and politicians that represent those people. Um, so at this time, uh, Vice President Reese, um, I'd like to allow you to make the motion. 
uh, for the resolution? Yes. Um, hold on. Does the resolution have a number? No, just okay, a, just a, okay. Um, yes, I would like to submit a resolution launching the Hamilton County Equity and Resource Mobile Tech Bus Draft. Uh, I mean, mobile tech bus. Um, and then I want to say, I guess I'll read the, the last part of it, um, if that's okay, or how do you want me to do it? Sure, go on. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, be it, be it, I'll say, be it further resolved that the Hamilton County Equity and Resource Mobile Tech Bus should be, maybe I'll go up further, I'm sorry. That mm -hmm. one. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Hamilton County Board of County Commissioners does hereby approve the launching and creation of Hamilton County Equity and Resource Mobile Tech Bus. And be it further resolved that the administration is hereby directed to identify funding within the current CARES Act allocations to support acquisition of the Hamilton County Equity and Resource Mobile Tech Bus and develop an operation and maintenance plan or stewardship of the vehicle for three years. Be it further resolved that the Hamilton County Board of Commissioners direct county administration to explore all channels for initiating this program as expeditiously as possible, including but not limited to traditional public procurement or grants, as well as partnering with organizations and agencies. And be it further resolved that the Hamilton County Equity and Resource Mobile Tech Bus uh, should be styled like but not limited to the Hampton University Mobile Bus model with COVID testing, COVID vaccine distribution, Wi Fi technology, pharmacy and mobile tech access to economic resources for residents and small businesses. Be it further resolved that the Hamilton County equity and resource mobile tech bus should be programmed and designed in a way that provides maximum flexibility for multi-purpose use and availability for all municipalities in Hamilton County as needed to help residents and small businesses. And be it further resolved that the Hamilton County equity and resource mobile tech bus be designed to be multi-purpose in the future, to have long-term sustainability under, I mean, even after COVID-19 is over, to provide healthcare and economic resources to residents throughout the county and underserved communities to address the health disparities that are prevalent in these communities with, uh, but not limited to, screening, preventative care, and management of chronic disease. Be it further resolved that the administration um, has the Hamilton County Equity and Resource Mobile Bus uh, with a goal to launch in sometime in April for Minority Health Month with a goal. Adopted, uh, well, and therefore I submit this for passage. Thank you so much. Um, and before you make your motion, I'm gonna open it up for Administrator Jeff Aludo, if he had any comments. Oh, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam President. Um, uh, so um, I, and I appreciate the work that uh, uh, Vice President Reese and, and her office have, have done with this. We've been working with them offline a, a little bit on this. And I, I do, as I read the resolution in, in its form, in its current form, um, I do think that, I, and I appreciate the flexibility uh, that it provides to the, the administration to initiate the program um, in, in the way that will will work best. And I think that that is important. I mean, I think what we're looking to do is provide is, if I discern the conversation correctly, is to uh, get a Hampton like uh, service uh, on the street uh, as quickly as possible, uh, wrapped and customized. Um, and I say that figuratively um, uh, for Hamilton County's needs um, as they may be uh, present in, uh, in uh, for, for um, delivery of health services and other programmatic services that we may uh, look to uh, wrap around that yet. Um, and I do think that flexibility is, is important. And uh, Vice President Reese mentioned uh, that, uh, and I had advised that we take the health collaborative specifically uh, out uh, of the resolution precisely for the reason that we wanna make sure that we do whatever we can within the context of the resolution uh, so that it can be implemented quickly. And my concern was that if we are overly prescriptive in terms of how this has to work, 
uh, that if it turns out that there is some reason why this can't work through a specifically through the specifically named avenue in the resolution that we have to come back to the board and we're, when we're starting from scratch. So I think the resolution uh, gives us the flexibility uh, to, to, to uh, as long as we are um, end result focused to do this in a variety of ways that could be uh, procurement, that could be some sort of agreement with another community partner uh, that has a resource uh, currently available. It could be through some other sourcing options. It could be through a state procurement contract uh, something like that. But um, as we move forward, and I'm discerning a lot of information into just a couple of statements here, you know, I think we have a couple of different tracks here. We've got um, the procurement track. We also have the programming uh, track as well. Uh, and so the two of those are going to need to mesh together. Uh, we need to make sure that the programming, of, that, the, that ultimately what we procure um, is not inconsistent with the programming that we want to we want to wrap into this. So there's going to be a little bit of complexity there, um, but uh, nothing that we haven't done before, just in different, in different areas. Um, I would say that my, my biggest concern at this point is, in fact, and I appreciate the fact that uh, Vice President Reese um, in her resolution uh, in, uh, 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 indicated a goal of April. Um, I, I, we were on, we were on a call with, uh, I think the vendor that, uh, that, uh, initiated or implemented the Hampton bus um, a few weeks ago. And at the time he had said, um, you know, if you were to tell me today, I think I could have something for you uh, in April. Um, my intuition tells me that's without a procurement process that if we had to go through that. Um, I know that it takes us uh, from the time that we spec um, specialty equipment in the engineer's office at the time that we're rolling it on site, it can be up to a year at times. Now, I am, uh, uh, I think there might be different ways to do this, whether we do a separate, a separate procurement for uh, the, the RV uh, and then retrofit it, build it out later, work off the state procurement contract, find a community partner. There's, we're going to look at a lot of different ways to do this, to expedite this and get the service up and running. Uh, as quickly as we can, but I just want to again caution uh, that I do have some concern with the April timing period. That's why I was uh, happy to see that it was um, um, specified as a goal uh, in April. Um, and finally, um, just in terms of follow up on this, uh, as we as the administration starts down this path, we will have to ultimately come back to the board uh, on this, and that would be for the, at the time when we have a program together and we need to do the appropriation resolution, we need to do a purchase contract, et cetera, um, that will come back to the board at that point in time uh, for that. I'm sure the board expected that, anticipates it, um, but I just wanted to make sure that, the, uh, that from this point onward that we were on the same page in terms of when that next touch point would be. I'll certainly keep the board apprised of how we are moving forward, but there, there will be additional formal action done, um, assuming that there is a procurement that would exceed my authority um, but that would come back to the board for appropriation and contracting. So I, I just wanted to chime in on a few of those things, Madam President. So thank you for the deferral uh, and happy to answer any questions if, if I can. Otherwise, we will uh, we will follow up with the board as we move forward um, following the resolution. Thank you. Uh, any comments or questions as it relates to our administrator's comments? Okay. Madam President, I just want to, yes. I want to thank the administration. And I just think that our main focus here, I think um, the message, at least the intent of the resolution is that we want this to move forward as a priority. What I don't want is that uh, what happened with the health gap, you know, win a bid in 2017 and then come back in 2021 and just get the contract. Or like we're doing with the, um, with the disparity study, it was in July announced and they said, well, some difficulties, so we're just coming back. I like to, one of the things about equity is having the same, uh, they call fire in the belly as we do uh, when we are doing other contracts or we're doing port authorities or big deals or all these things that come and say, we got to go right now. Um, this is a right now thing because this is affecting people's health right now. Um, so with however creative as we are with other things I've seen when we've been creative and then I've seen some things when we haven't been creative. Uh, and so I just want to, I'm, I'm happy to hear that the, uh, that Jeff is saying that they're going to be creative with this. This is not a 2022 program. 
this is a 2021 program. Um, and that is, uh, you know, some of the things that you heard from uh, Joe Mallory, president of the NAACP and the things that we're all fighting against when we talk about double standards. So um, I looking forward to it and turn over everything that I have uh, talked to uh, and would hope that you know, if this is passed today, that a call is made immediately to the governor's people to get moving, to Kroger's to get moving, to UC Health that's ready to move, that does, like you mentioned, the mammography bus, they've got a bus, they're ready to move. Uh, so I just wanted to just make sure we understand that this is a 2021 project. Thank you, Madam President. And Madam President, I just mm -hmm. would say I, I completely appreciate that and we will explore uh, every option and pathway we have, uh, as, as, we, as we always do. Um, at the same time, I just want to caution that if the, if the avenue that we have to go, especially if we find that the only pathway forward on this procurement is a traditional spec purchase and, and, and uh, bid process, that, that is a lengthy process. And I hope we can find a more uh, a uh, strategic way around that and a different thing that we can do. I just, again, want to caution uh, that um, if, if that is the only way that we can do this and deliver what the board wants, the timing on that um, is a longer uh, term process and we will do everything we can to expedite it. Uh, but I just, if I have to come back to the board later and say that we on a, on a much longer timeline here, I, uh, I would rather have that conversation now and, and make sure the board understands that now uh, than have to come back later um, with a uh, saying, telling you something that I didn't mention up front. So that's my only reason for bringing it up now. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And, and, and we know, um, you know, this is a board priority. Um, and also I have, you know, I have faith in the administration that they will expeditiously go forward to do the things they need to do. And at the same time, safeguard uh, the fact that this is maybe a big ticket item and we don't want to, uh, be in trouble not following the, the, the proper procedures. Um, and so um, I have also have faith that um, we'll look at the best option that can allow this to happen uh, if it's passed as quickly as possible. Um, so um, Vice President Reese, if you'd like to make a motion just reading uh, item four. Uh, yeah, title, I'd like Does to. It, I didn't hear you. Just the title, please, that's all. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Resolution launching Hamilton County Equity at Resource Mobile Tech Bus. Mm -hmm. Passage. Yeah. Second. Commissioner Summer Dumas? Yes. Commissioner Reese? Yes. Commissioner Driehaus? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Can I also thank our staff? Because most yes. of these associations happened uh, with the chiefs of staff. So I, I personally mm -hmm. want to thank my own chief of staff and the other chiefs of staff. Yeah, I will also thank mine. Uh, so everybody worked together for the same purpose. So, and once again, I thank everyone who's still on the line that came in and uh, gave comments. So thank you very much. Thank you very, and thank you, Dr. Ken Marshall. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My you. pleasure. Thank you all very much for everything you're doing. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we have an executive session well, we gotta re oh, we gotta go back to the resolution for the um, oh, goodness. Yes, we do. I'm sorry. Yeah, resolution number three, PO forty one dash twenty one. Jeff. Yeah, so I I think we now have uh, Phil Reed on on the line. Phil, um, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, there we go. Uh, so we I have... apologize very much for the earlier difficulties. <laughs> yeah, so I'm I'm glad you're there. Um, so. Uh, just to go back, and I'm not going to entirely repeat uh, the opening uh, that I had given previously, um, but uh, just to indicate that we have a procurement uh, before the board. It came this past Thursday. Um, the uh, procurement was related to electronic monitoring services. Uh, that is a critical component of what we do in, in our county jail to make sure that we are uh, preserving that scarce and uh, critical um, uh, uh, jail space for the most serious offenders. Um, so the, the bids that came in, the uh, recommendation from probation was to switch vendors this year. So we were, we were going down, starting the, well, we would start to go down that process once the board 
uh, acts on the agreement. There were some questions that came up specifically regarding the award. Those questions mostly related uh, to issues of the allowance, uh, as well as some logistical issues related to the change out of batteries and the, and the operations of the individual units. So um, Phil, do you, um, would you like to walk the board through those two issues in particular? And uh, I do appreciate uh, Phil and Joanne Kramer from purchasing uh, and the information they were able to provide over the past couple of days. But Phil, would you like to walk the board through those two elements? Absolutely. When we put out the invitation to bid, there were eight companies that put in bids and we narrowed it down to three. Three companies came in with the presentation and the first company was Attenti. They came into the presentation and prior to that presentation, I had questioned them about their bid and the allowance for the lost stolen equipment. Now I have the figures from BI Incorporated who is the former contract holder and that allowance was $300,000 on average per year. Attenti, in an answer to an email I sent, told us that they had a 10% equipment allowance, lost stolen equipment allowance. Sentinel has 100% equipment allowance on lost stolen equipment. But they said in the meeting that we had here in this building that the allowance was also 10%. And so twice they mentioned the 10% from a Tenti allowance. Sentinel has maintained all along that they will provide 100% allowance for the lost stolen equipment. So for that reason, we chose Sentinel as the company to present a contract with the county because the allowance added to a Tenti's bid made, them, made their bid more than what Sentinel had bid. They claimed that they had a 100% allowance. That would have been fine if they had told us that right at the beginning, but they told us on two separate occasions that it was a 10% allowance. So we added that amount with 10% off to their initial bid to have the correct amount of the bid for the board to evaluate. But they did go beyond Sentinel bid, and that is why we chose Sentinel, and their equipment provides a lot more advantageous things that we need to use for this. We have 550 people on the program starting today, which is a very, very equitable program as far as saving money from incarcerating a lot of these people. But as we went on, we had a, an extensive evaluation system. We went by points. And Attenti was the third rated company, but we did have them come in for their presentation, giving them the benefit of the doubt. But we asked them on two occasions what their allowance was for lost stolen equipment, and they said 10%. And Sentinel agreed for 100% coverage of the lost stolen equipment. Um, any questions so far? Um, I'll see if our commissioners have any questions as it relates to field uh, statements. Uh, Vice President Reese, did you have any question? Uh, I just have one question, just understanding. So you're saying originally there was some information that they left out, which caused their bid to be higher. Is that the gist of it or am I? Yes, um, the original bid and our answer and the answer to our invitation to bid left out anything, did not mention anything about lost stolen equipment. That was a tenty. That is why I sent out an email to the person who wrote their bid trying to clarify this situation. And she sent an email back saying that their general allowance for a program this size is 10%. Then when their committee came for their presentation, they also said 10% then. And that would add quite a bit of money to the overall value of the contract. 
Got you. Thank you, Madam President. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Driehaus. I have no questions. Okay. Um, I just, um, you know, I asked a lot of questions as it relates to this agreement, and I most of them were answered. I just need to say I'm looking, I looked up both companies and, and researched them both. Um, and as we know, uh, lawsuits always happen um, to different uh, municipalities and things like that, different agencies. So some of them could be frivolous. But I was really concerned about um, people that had used this equipment um, prisoners, former prisoners, and there was some uh, defects in the equipment. They ended up going to jail longer because equipment didn't act right and said they were somewhere that they weren't. So the bottom line is uh, whoever we choose, and I'm comfortable with Sentinel, is that there be some quality assurance component uh, for this company if they don't have it, uh, because the people that are wearing these things, really, I think a lot of them don't know uh, their rights and this is a five-year agreement. So I just, I mean, the horror stories that I read this morning um, were very disheartening. Um, so um, Phil, I don't know uh, if they, how often they have to report to you. Well, you'll know when the equipment is broken, but I'm just really concerned about in a general nature, the people that are having to use these and that um, their rights are not violated in any way. Uh, and we don't read those. Uh, as many stories as I read this morning. So I just wanted to make that general comment. Um, anything else from anyone? We're ready to call the question. Um, I'd like to make a motion to adopt resolution number P P014, I'm sorry, P041-21, authorizing the award and execution of this agreement between Sentinel Offender Services. Is there a second? Second. Commissioner Summer Dumas? Yes. Commissioner Reese? Yes. Commissioner Driehaus? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, what I'd like to do uh, before we go into executive session is see if any of our uh, my colleagues had any um, comments that they wanted to make before we go in. Um, I wanted to make one as it relates to, I don't know if you saw yesterday in the paper about um, the Tower Platoon Homeless um, Center. I may not be including the whole name, but uh, their lease contract ends March the 31st. And um, they are serving a lot of homeless people. And uh, from reading the article, they're going around trying to get some donations to keep that facility open. Uh, um, from what I read, they need $18,000 to for a lease uh, to maintain that facility. I'm not asking you to, to deal with it now, but um, administration is looking into our ability to do that. And I would like to present it uh, before the 31st to see if the commission is uh, in favor of helping out uh, that facility. So I just wanted to, to say that up front so it doesn't surprise you when, when you get more information on it. Um, and Madam and, President, if I could just very briefly, um, sure. we, we have been in, in contact with the Muslim <laughs> Army um, on, on that particular issue. And as the board is aware in, in our CARES Act plan, we do have uh, operation through our contract with strategies to end homelessness. We do have operation of the day shelter uh, as part of that ongoing continued operation. So um, we may have to uh, look at some ongoing budget issues for that. So um, we were looking to bring something back to the board uh, to amend the strategies contract to allow um, the uh, continued operation of the day shelter through an appropriate period through, through the year. Mm -hmm. So um, we are working on that and uh, hope to have something back. It may be by leave, but hope to have something back to you before the end of the month here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that would be great. And Phil jumped off before I was able to. Oh, there. He oh, I'm still on. Okay, I just wanted to thank you for your additional information. It was very helpful. Thank you. And reference your comment, Commissioner. Yes. Uh, we are very, very careful not to violate people's rights. Mm -hmm. And the school equipment operates on GPS, mm -hmm. Wi-Fi, and cellular tower. So there's three different checks as far as knowing where the people are. Okay, thank you. Um, I was uh, aware of that field, but it, it uh, does not function right sometimes. So uh, we'll just make sure that we monitor that as closely as we can. Um, Absolutely. 
Okay, thank you so much. Um, so we have in front of us um, item five executive session uh, pursuant to RC section 121.22G G4 regarding collective bargaining. I'd like to make a motion to go in executive session. Second. Mr. Summer Dumas? Yes. Ms. Reese? Yes. Ms. Driehaus? Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Got an echo. There's an echo somewhere. Oh, boy, boy, boy. Let's be on one second while we um, clear the other side. One second. Hi, Brett. Hello there. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I don't know how you do that. And there's <coughs> Bill. <laughs> don't say anything. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Phil, are you staying on for this? No, he's not. Okay. Yeah, can you? Can you? Can you take mm -hmm. him off, Bridget? Yep. Frank, I think we have you on. You're on a video. You're on twice. You're on an attendee as well. Can you go ahead and say something to make sure it's you? Unmute on your end. Uh, I think I'm unmuted now. Yep, you are. Okay, 